All right, welcome everybody. This is episode number 64 of Sports Cards Live, November 25th, 2020. Thanks for joining. During this pregame warm up, I do want to thank last Wednesday's guest, Barry Ma, ComC of ComC. ComC Barry was a great guest. We talked about everything ComC. Check out that episode, it's in the archives on the YouTube channel. I also want to thank last Saturday's guest. Amit Acharya, we did a virtual sport card expo day one recap, and boy, that was awesome. The show was great. The, 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 the sports cards live episode after was great. The virtual was awesome. Had a great time. I uh, want to thank everybody who came by the booth and said hello. That was really, really awesome. This coming Saturday, our guest will be Ken Reed. He is an author of several books, several sports books, hockey mostly, and also uh anchor on the national network Sportsnet up in canada want to i'm looking forward to that episode he's been on before this is going to be great he is a fan of sports and sports cards so that will be great and then next saturday coming back again will be leaf ceo brian gray and if you've seen episodes with him before you know that they are among the best and we have great discussion so come out and check that one out next saturday if you're new here there's 75 episodes in the library so far. Go check those out. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do. I'd greatly appreciate it. Almost at 1,500 subscribers. So thank you to everyone who has subscribed already. I want to shout out the Basketball Card Fanatic magazine. That's this guy right here. There's three issues so far. They are all awesome. Really good content. I've printed them. It's an email. It's an emailed magazine that you'll get from Adam. But this thing is awesome. I printed them out in color and I recommend you subscribe if you are looking for some more hobby content. Great interviews. One of them has Lior Abidar from Alt on this issue here. This issue had a conversation with Nat Turner. It's like eight pages long, really insightful. I recommend you check it out. And I'm gonna throw up on, a, on the ticker right now to subscribe to the Basketball Card Fanatic Magazine, visit paypal.me slash basketball card, mention sports cards live, and send him $20 for a three-month trial or $80 for 12 whole months. Check that out. Also want to mention, everybody, December 8th through 10th, Sports Card Investor and eBay are presenting the virtual holiday sports card conference. And I am proud to announce, or well, to announce again, because they did today, that I will be a featured speaker during that that event, which I'm really looking forward to. So be sure to check that out. I also want to announce that for the first time, Sports Cards Live has an official sponsor. The sponsor is the big three sports cards. So I want to, I'm going to throw that up there right now. Everybody check out the big three sports cards on Instagram. You can follow them at the big three hockey. Really proud of this affiliation, highly reputable, lots of integrity. And these guys deal in high end sports card singles. So be sure to check them out on Instagram for one of the best pages you can follow on there. All right, tonight we do have a guest and at the end of the episode, we, were gonna, we are going to do the Sports Cards Live 5 and we're also gonna do Card of the Day segments. So check those out, stick around till the end. And as always, your comments and your questions are in play. So don't be shy, but be a little bit shy because I don't wanna have to, uh, you know, we're not gonna be a complaint department tonight. I'll just put it to you that way. So. Let's get to tonight's guest who got his start in the hobby in the late 1970s, collecting tops basketball and football card with his brother from the corner 7-Eleven. He collected until high school. He took a break until he graduated college. And in the end, in the early 90s, started working at Beckett Media. He did a stint at Donruss, but returned to Beckett where he was until he joined Panini in 2010 as director of hobby marketing. He's a fixture at the National, represents Panini, with his positive attitude and his infectious energy. He's a diehard Denver Broncos fan. He's also He also cheers for the Dallas Stars and the Dallas Mavericks. Born and bred in Texas, let's bring him out. Tracy Hackler, welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing tonight, my man? Jeremy, doing well, man. Thanks for having me on with that um, that introduction. I need to hire you to kind of walk around with me and and be my barker, man. Yeah, well, I'd say happy to, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't be. Yeah. No, I got other things to do. But yeah, man, hey, it's a, it's it's great to have you, Tracy. I, you know, I've known you for several years, going back to the days when Panini did have a hockey license, and you'd come up to the Toronto Expo, and you know, I mean it, man. You've always been just a really nice guy, good to hang out with, and uh, truly, I, you know, I meant it when I said it. No, I really appreciate it, man. It's, uh, you know, the one thing I've learned in in 
more than half my life in this industry is uh, the people are, are what make it. Uh, and so likewise, the feeling is mutual. I appreciate that, buddy. I appreciate that. So listen, we're going to, we're going to jump right in with what I call the jump ball question to kick things off. And so I, I was, it was a toss up between two. I'd like the first question to be one, you know, a little bit of a challenging question. And I, there were, there were two that I wanted to to start off with. The first one, we'll start out with the original and then we'll move into the second. Then we'll welcome all the all the viewers we have. So, and, and I just want to say to the viewers, I'm not looking at your comments, questions right now, but if you're firing away, please note that I may not get to them for 10, 15 minutes. So please be patient. All right, Tracy, a lot of people are somewhat concerned with print runs as it applies to cards like Panini Prism, Prism Silvers, that kind of thing. People think that Panini just run the presses. Can you... Let, and I mean, obviously you have to run the presses to fill your quotas, but can you let us know, give us some information on, do you guys simply run the presses until there's no more card stock on the planet or do you not? Let's no, hear. no, we, we don't run the presses. I mean, there, there are times in our production facility where there, there are multiple shifts running, but that has more to do with the, the, the number of different products that might be in production at any given time. But no, the, the, the thing that, that I love so much about our company and the, the, the dudes who actually make the products, uh, put the schemes in, the, the numbering, the checklist. Those folks have long before they were product developers, they were passionate collectors and they still are passionate collectors. And they lived through that, that crazy time in the early nineties where um, volume was such that, value became uh, really worthless and nobody wants to to repeat that. And so I think our product development guys, uh, David Porter, Robert Springs, Nick Matilic, so many guys who've got hundreds and hundreds of combined years in this um, industry, understand the importance of, of uh, supply and demand, understand the importance of not, not running through things. And so, have the volumes increased over the last few years? Sure, but not to a point where uh, it's detrimental to being a collector or uh, getting value out of something. You know, with that, would you like, I don't want to state the obvious, but, or, or even pose the obvious question, but um, how, you know, demand is obviously higher now than it's been in 20, 30 years. How, to what extent do you guys, feel that, see that, how does it like, do you have an estimate as to how much it's grown even the last five years? Let, let's say the last five years, any idea of how much the hobby has grown? Man, it's hard to put a, a, a hardcore number on that, but, uh, but it is unlike anything I've ever seen in my 25 years as a, uh, as a professional in this hobby. And, you know, back when I was started collecting in the late seventies, um, what we're seeing right now is, truly legitimately unprecedented and uh uh so, so putting a number on it is it's almost futile because it that number becomes irrelevant to tomorrow um yeah. but it is absolutely it, it boggles the mind of people who've been doing this far longer than i have and so there there are any number of factors that are possible contributors to the 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 explosion but um it defies a, a logic in some cases so on that same sort of uh topic you know we've seen you know is there any precedent for a card that is in a in the in a psa 10 with a population of fourteen thousand and a market value of seventeen thousand dollars per uh, has that ever happened? I mean, silly. Has that ever happened before? Because that's what no, we're seeing with the Luca Prism base card. No, it's it's there is no precedent for something like that. I mean, nobody used to talk about modern cards the way modern cards are being talked about now. The the stories that that are making the rounds on TMZ Sports or of people breaking these blockbuster cards out of products that released this week or last week. Um, it's never been, it's unprecedented. And, and I don't know that we've even <laughs> reached the top. I mean, it, it, because whenever we think we've seen it all, 
we see something new next week. And so um, it's a really, uh, I think surreal is probably an accurate word. It's a pretty surreal time to be in the industry. Uh, and, but it is just so exciting. And obviously the responsibility that we have as um, exclusive manufacturers of a lot of uh, key products, we don't take that lightly and we don't just run the presses. We, we understand that there's a marketplace we're trying to, to, uh, to f foster and to protect. Does it, does it blow your mind, Tracy, to think that that Luca prison base and the PSA 10 is worth $1,700 when I remember I bought mine at the national in 2019 for $40. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Like, is it, is it as mind blowing for you guys at Panini as it is for myself and fellow collectors? Well, yes. And a simple one more answer is yes. But I have the luxury of sharing an office with one of my best friends and Scott Prusia. And we, we will just sit there and kind of uh, talk about it. Like, like it's almost not real. Like, we just can't wrap our heads around it because when those first, even before the Luca rookie, but the, when those first prison products came out, I mean, it was kind of people coveted them and they, and they embraced them, but not to the level that they've grown to embrace them over the last few years, really. And um, when we think about what cards were, were valued at then, because Scott, when, Scott's the guy who puts together a lot of our promo sets for the national or back in the day at the Toronto expo. And, and so he will look at values sometimes to determine who he wants to put in his checklist. And uh, he, he looks at those values now and compares them to where they were when the products hit. And it's just phenomenal. It's almost like a joke. Now we kind of laugh it off because we, we don't know what other reaction we should have to something like that. Just laugh. That's all you can do, right? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, man. Let's turn to the other sort of challenging question that I want to bring up with you today. Um, because, you know, I posted that you were going to come on and people started uh, adding some, some comments to the posts. And the one that I saw a few times had to do with redemptions. And I know, you know, I've talked about it on the show with with Chris Barr, also of Panini. I've talked about it with uh, people from other sports card companies as well. But, you know, here we are today, you're here, and, you know, not everybody saw those episodes. So let's talk a little bit about redemptions and, you know, why they take so long, really. I mean, that's, that's that, you know, you get people, they like, they you get people that want to know why they've been holding these things for, uh, you know, an extended period of time, they get angry and they get and they get frustrated and I can I can understand that, but I think that you know it helps to understand and hearing it from the horse's mouth what causes this perhaps to get some under to, perhaps to gain some understanding from the from the hobby community. Can you speak to the redemptions and why some of them take two three years to fulfill? Uh, well, let me first of all say redemptions uh, um they suck uh, you know, there, there's no simple way to say it other than that we we despise redemption cards as much as anybody in the industry does and we we try our our darndest and we have a whole department who's dedicated to to having as absolutely few redemptions as possible in every given product and i think the last numbers i saw were like 96 percent of of autographs are live over the course of our of our product year, um, and maybe that's even higher. But what when there there is an extended amount of wait time, because in theory, right in the best case scenario, it's an instant gratification. I pulled this a redemption when I should have pulled an autograph. We understand that we hate it. We we tr do our best to to make it as painless as possible. That's not always possible. So a, a, a lot of the the time that we're waiting is kind of out of our hands. We the the players have the cards um, or the stickers, and we're a lot of times we're just waiting for them to sign. And for a lot of these younger players, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, but for a lot of these younger players, what their sole focus is, especially that first year, is is making the team or or starting their careers on the right path. So once the season starts and training camp start or spring training or 
things like that, you really start to, to lose guys' attention because only because of their working on their profession and not thinking about trading cards. So that's why uh, the, the rookie fo- the r- NFL PA rookie premiere and the NBA r- rookie photo shoot and this uh, Panini spring training road trip are such uh, monumental events for us because it allows us to knock out the lion's share of a lot of those players' autographs on location where they're they're in our site, they're kind of on our tab, and we're watching them and, and helping them sign as um, efficiently and as cleanly as possible. So when you don't have those events, and it's not that's not just the reason, but when you don't have those events and you're, you're trusting of – you have to trust the uh, mail system and you have to trust the, the player agents or the player representatives – uh, communicating with the athlete and commu- communicating with our acquisitions folks, um, there can be delays. And, and in extreme cases, such as Julio Jones, who we uh, chased for years, literally several years, but we didn't want to give up on him because his cards were such key uh, parts of that rookie season that we, work with him and work with him and work with him and work with him until we finally got it done. So, um, but usually it's because we're waiting on signatures to be returned. Uh, You know, that that's what I've been led to believe that makes logical sense. So help me out with this one, because this came out, uh, I saw a comment on one of the pieces today uh, that took me for, you know, it was out of left field to me. Um, the gentleman, his name is Zach, he said something like, I've been waiting for redemptions that aren't autographed. Like, I, I can't, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of an of a redemption. Now, maybe it's because I just haven't, I'm not familiar with the products that it appears in, but I'm not familiar with why, uh, with any products where a redemption would be in there that doesn't have an autograph on it. Do, is this something you're familiar with or is this kind of out of left field to you too? And uh, let's understand here, For I, I understand this, Trace, but I want I want the, the viewership to understand too that, you're not in production. You're the marketing guy. So you may not be the right guy to ask this question of. And I want you to just, if you don't have an answer, that's 100% okay. But if you have any insights, I think we'd appreciate it. No. And look, if I don't have the answer, I'll tell you. And I'll try to get the answer when when, when I'm, I'm back in the office. But for a card that doesn't have a redemption, the only thing I can think of there's a, or a for a redemption that doesn't have an autograph, there's only a few special instances I can think of. One of them is a... It's a, uh, a gold or silver card from uh, probably contenders, or it could be an etched glass card from um, Absolute. But other than that, um, and those all should be produced and in-house, um, I can't – but those are initially um, inserted into packs as redemptions, um, the gold and silver cards and the etched glass cards. But other than that, I can't – um, I'm just trying to think. It could be the XRC uh, cards from Select Football, which some are autographed, some are, are not. But um, other than those instances, I can't think of another reason why uh, he would be waiting on a non-autograph redemption card. Okay. Well, hey, I appreciate you uh, taking a stab at it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, – it is what it is uh, for right now, but um, okay, let's move on. Let's uh, let's say hi to the people we have watching. You know, we've got great viewership right now, Tracy. So I'm going to take a few minutes and just welcome everybody to the show. We got Ziggy in the house. Good evening, Jeremy and Tracy. Happy early Happy early Thanksgiving to you as well, Ziggy. Howdy, Legion. Yes. Great to have you as always. B Roy, happy to have you. I'm looking forward to another good one tonight as well. Paul C, good to have you. Jeremy Pringle, welcome to the show. Legion, good see, good seeing everyone at the Virtual Expo. Yeah, the Virtual Expo was awesome. It was great to see everyone. I do want to thank everybody that did come by and hang out at my booth with me, whether you came on video or just chatting away in the chat. It was awesome. Made for a great two days of nonstop streaming. Really loved it. So thanks to everybody for coming by. Rondell, hi, guys. Happy American Thanksgiving. Looking forward to a great show. The Expo was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Yes, for sure. Terry Fortune, good evening to you. Charles, welcome. Jake from 90s B-Ball Cards, good evening to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Joey O'Hearn, thanks for the altered advice yesterday, Jeremy. I brought I bought the Mickey Mantle and will be with me soon. Atta boy, Joey. Way to go. Congratulations on the acquisition. Jeff McMahon, hello to you and welcome. Al G, always a pleasure to have you. The 27 guy, this is Adam, who is the 
editor in chief of the Basketball Card Fanatic. I'll throw it up there right now. I, uh, you know, I subscribe. I love the magazine. I've been reading it. I wouldn't encourage anyone to spend money on something that I wouldn't spend money on myself. So, uh, if you want to subscribe, you're looking for some more content. Check out the magazine. It's on the ticker right now. Tiger Jordan, good evening and th happy Thanksgiving to you, Ziggy. Awesome. Yes, the virtual. Oh, yes. Ziggy's speaking about the sports card investor and eBay virtual holiday where I will be guest speaking. And thanks, Ziggy, for the support. Joe Perot, great to have you. We are not going 360 minutes tonight. 120 <laughs> probably max. Absolute. Good to have you back. Feel like it's a, one of those long time no see sort of things. Rep and Rajon, great to have you from Vermont. And you're watching it live. Good to have you live, my friend. The Card Hobbyist, welcome to the show. Absolute. Yes, to you as well. Here's a question for you, Tracy, from Ziggy. He wants to know if it's possible to get a public tour at the production facility. Uh, we we have we don't do that as a as a company policy, but I know that we when the the industry summit was in Dallas a few years ago, we took everyone, uh, all the attendees to the production facility and um, they were fascinated and it's an eye-opening experience. I've been with Panini now 10 years and I still feel like a kid on Christmas morning going over to the production facility to see, because that's where everything happens, right? Like all the things we do in the office um, at uh, Corporate HQ, it's great stuff and it's uh, it's uh, fundamental to what we do, but they're all telling all the things we do from photo to pre-press to product development to, to um, acquisitions, all the things they do to lay the groundwork is for everything that happens at the production facility from printing, cutting, UV coating, uh, foil stamping, packaging, uh, shipping. It's, it is, a must see if you ever get the chance and we don't offer uh, private tours, but if you ever get the chance, you have to do it. And, and if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel and seen a lot of our uh, making of videos, uh, do yourself a favor, pigeonhole some time on a weekend or on a, a rainy or snowy day and go check some of those out because they're just fascinating. And I love that's the one of the favorite parts of my job. Sounds good, man. And if I ever get the chance to check out the production facility, I will take you up on that for sure. Yes. Hockey Cards official, welcome to you. Uh, Reppin Rajan has a question here. It's legit. And he's not trying to, says right here, not trying to give you time. Genuinely curious. Can you, can you find out, is, can you ask, is there a set time or amount of years for redemptions as to when Panini gives up on the player ever signing them and sends them a replacement? Do you have, do you guys have a policy or a standard on that timeline? Well, I think on the cards themselves, I think we offer a four month or eight month window of whether you want to wait. And then at the end of those, whatever window you checked, um, you can continue to wait if it's a player that that um, that you want or a card that you want or we'll offer a replacement. And, and in many cases, we'll offer a replacement b before then if if indeed someone feels strongly enough about it. But I mean, it depends on the player, obviously, but. Um, we will go years and years and years if it's the right, if it, if we need to, whether that's, you know, I brought up Julio Jones earlier is a great example of that. Um, I don't, uh, I'm trying to think of some others. OBJ, I know we waited for a while. Uh, Khalil Mack, Devontae Adams. Um, we'll, we'll wait it out because our, because our folks don't like to, to, to not complete a mission. And if their task is getting Julio Jones autographs, they have a sense of pride as well. And they want to go get those. And a lot of times it's an absurdly amount of time, but our people are, are committed to the, to the cause. That's good to hear. It's good to hear that there's commitment there and that you guys don't take it lightly because the hobby certainly doesn't. And, you know, it's it's good. It's just great to have these insights. So thanks again for making yourself available for us tonight, Tracy. Sure. Uh, I just want to, Dilraj says, Big Three Hockey, great collector. Again, Big Three Hockey, a Big Three Sports Cards on the ticker. Brand new sponsor of Sports Cards Live. Very happy and excited about that. Okay, uh, Hockey 99, Jeremy with a legendary phrase on his T-shirt, more cowbell. Who doesn't more love that? Cowbell. Right? The yeah. card collector, welcome to you. Welcome to you. Uh, okay. 
just going to run through some of these comments. How long? How long? How long? A lot of how long questions, Tracy. We've addressed <laughs> some of them, so I'm not gonna, we're not going to readdress some of them. Let's see what Paul says. One thing Panini has to be credit for, for having a player blurb or bio on the back of autograph cards. I wish other card makers did the same versus the cut and paste. Congratulations. Uh, and that, that's, that's, a, that's a good comment, uh, Paul, I think, because I'm with you on that. I always feel like um, we, we paid our good money. We don't need a congratulations. You know? <laughs> congratulations is like, it's almost like, it is just not, it's not appropriate anymore. I think it was appropriate back when they were one in 10,000 polls to pull an autograph. Nowadays, when you know you're getting one in every pack, enough with the congratulations. All right. <laughs> Jeremy Pringle set up, says, Upper Deck Artifact Rookies were redemptions and not autos. And Jeremy, that's because they are put out before the player is allowed to have a card. So that, that, that makes sense. Slow Pitch says, hello, Jeremy. Hello, Tracy. Good to see you, my friend. We miss you up here. Hope to see you and Scotty again one day up here for the expo. We all would love to see that for sure, for sure. Greetings to you, Brent Terman, Matt Chang. Welcome to the show. Darcy, good to have you as always, my friend. Greetings, salutations. Panini, please bring back national treasures, buried treasures, metal Stanley Cup autos, awesome cards. Yeah, Darcy, those are great cards. They need a license first, <laughs> right? Hockey Hockey says, how do you navigate being a collector and working for one of the biggest brands in the industry? You want to take that one, Tracy? That's a great question. I think um, the thing that drives most of us and the people that I've been closest to, um, not just at Panini, but but in other places, is our passion, not just for sports, but specifically for sports cards. I mean, you, you go into our product development um, de department and you're going to see 20 people that grew up collecting that um, that are as passionate um, and as loving of this hobby as anybody I've ever seen. And um, and I think having all those different um, collecting lives, if you will, it, and we all have our own things that we that we collect versus others. Some guys are complete set. David Porter is a, a huge just he just collects everything. And I think a lot of that passion, a lot of the learnings, um, a, a lot of the likes and dislikes for certain things, you will see those woven into our products. So I think uh, being lifelong collectors is uh, a real benefit to the end result. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Ziggy does say production would be like a Willy Wonka factory tour to me. And uh, I'm with you, Ziggy. I think a lot of us would love to do that. Are there any public videos? So Tracy already directed everyone to the Panini YouTube channel for, for some videos into some behind the scenes stuff, which is pretty awesome. Uh, Jordan, even into you. Uh, Charles says, how did you turn this hobby into a job and what has the experience been like? Let's, you know, that's a great question right now. Lighten things up a little bit, Tracy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how, how this has been for you for the past? I mean, you, as I said in my intro, you've been working in the hobby since 1990 or so. Yeah, I've been, I've been in it professionally since 95. And I, I, um, I realized when I was a, probably about a sophomore in high school that I was not going to play sports at the next level. Because, I mean, I am who I am, and my, I've got my dad's genes. So, um, but I knew I wanted to work in sports, and I think recognizing that so early and and relatively early um, helped me. So I said, "Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a sports writer." So I started writing for the school paper back in high school. Uh, went to school for journalism at the University of North Texas, and had big big dreams of being a, a a beat writer covering a football team or uh, something of the sort of sports writer. And I was able to, I landed an internship at Beckett media back in 95, uh, the summer of 95. And then when, when that ended, um, I, I got married and then I started working at a local newspaper covering sport, high school sports and a little bit of college sports. And four months into that, uh, that gig Beckett, called me back and said, would you want to come on full time? And I think I was in their parking lot before I could hang up the phone uh, because I love <laughs> I love that magazine experience. It was just a different kind of deal than newspapers. And um, and that's where I started. And I was a, a, a lifelong content guy, loved sports writing, reading great sports writing and um, trying to write some of my own, but really just consuming sports through uh, the written word is what I always did. And then that 
that five, I had a five year stint at Beckett kind of working my way up the editorial uh, ladder. And then I had a chance to go in 2000 or uh, I'm sorry. And yeah, in 2000, I had a chance to go to Donruss and kind of add some different pieces to my, to my arsenal, if you will, on the marketing and PR side. I did that for four years, went back to Beckett for, for five. And then the opportunity of a lifetime opened up at Panini in 2010. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's just, but, but the things I think that, that have driven me or that have paved the way for me is you always need opportunities. You, you need a door open for you. And there are so many great people who open doors for people all the time. And once the, the doors are open, you have to take advantage of it, but passion and positivity and work ethic are the three things that I think have driven me um, and will continue to drive me until, until, <laughs> until I can't, can't drive anymore. Well, that, that comes through with you, man, from to the degree that I know you, you know, rubbing shoulders with you at the uh, Toronto Expo, the Nationals over the years. So that's awesome. Thanks for taking us through that. Let's get back to a few more comments here. Uh, Tiger Jordan says, any chance of prying Michael Jordan from Upper Deck and bringing him to Panini would be off the charts if that happened? What are the, I mean. I would agree. I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no chance. Yes. Off the charts. <laughs> uh, yeah. It would be off the charts. Yeah. It, um, yeah. Leave it at that. All right. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Amish Dave Archer. Good evening to you, Eric Stefano. Thank you so much. I, I have fun choosing my shirt before each it. episode. Ziggy has a question. Is Panini considering an exclusive club membership like tops does with their Montgomery club? That's a good question, Ziggy, and, and that I'm aware of. No, at this moment, I don't. Not that I've been privy to. There, there could be things. Uh, one of the things that that stinks about the pandemic, of the many things that stink about the pandemic, is that is that a lot of us aren't in the office all together anymore. So um, there could be things being wo worked on that I have no clue about. But to my knowledge, there there is no plan for that at this moment. Okay, perfect. Uh, Eric Stefano wants to help me remind everybody to hit that like button on the YouTube channel. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. I always forget to ask people to hit the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, all those sorts of things that help that that uh, algorithm produce results. I'm not sure how it works, but apparently it works. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Geovipicus12, I just joined, but will you work towards selling some products near SRP for beginning collectors? I would love for my kids to actually be able to join the hobby. $300 for hoops doesn't allow that. So Tracy, before you, you respond to this, I mean, I haven't seen this firsthand, but I have heard that Panini products right out of the gate are, are very expensive. Um, how do you guys uh, kind of manage that from, from your perspective? To the extent that you're aware, again, I recognize you're not in sales. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the... I want to preface anything by saying we're in unprecedented market conditions. I mean, we really are. So when, even when we have a product that's um, selling for quote unquote SRP, which, you know, that, that, that's kind of a, uh, uh, an old term by now for, for this current uh, climate. But when we, when we have retail focused uh, affordable products, in Target or Walmart or in retail, they're they're gone in many cases before they even hit the shelves, and and that's another topic probably for another show of how that happens and why that happens. But um, we still make score and and Donruss and hoops and uh, uh, I'm trying to see what is Geo Geo V Geo Vig picks. Call him Geo. Let's call him Geo. Yeah, Geo. No, that's a that's a great question, and we get that a lot, and uh, especially now. It um, and the answer is we're, we're going to keep our entire portfolio of products from from hoops or score all the way to flawless or eminence. We're going to continue making those, and there, there there have been times when we've had really difficult time moving some of that stuff. Obviously, now is not that time, and um, I don't know that we're going to apologize for the market conditions, but we, we do have to navigate them and we do have to uh, make sure that we continue creating valuable products at whatever price point it's 
uh, made to meet, um, whether that's $2.99 a pack or $1,500 a pack, uh, our job kind of remains the same. And uh, the market, again, it's just unprecedented. And we, we end up a lot of times pulling our hair out in the office thinking about or worrying about that. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Okay, man. Here, here's a nice comment from uh, from Jake from 90s B-Ball Cards. He says, can we talk for a second about the quality of cards coming out of packs? Seem, seeing a card get a gem mint grade over 50% of the time is a testament to the production quality. 90s cards were in great shape if they got a nine. Okay, Jake. N nice. A nice positive comment. I, I like it. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> I do like that. Well, it helps when a lot of those products are on Optichrome stock, right? They're so they they uh, unless they have shim lines or something from that, that uh, a lot of those cards are are thick and sturdy and I mean and even a lot of like the immaculates or NTs um, and the go down to the the Donruss hoops score quality too they're they're a lot more um, rugged rugged I don't know if the rugged's the right word but they're a lot more stand the test of time I guess. Yeah, it sounds like that particular card stock, especially the prism, just it's easier to work with. Is uh, yeah. you know, it doesn't slide around; it's heavier. Okay, Joe has a question here. What thought goes into Panini's decision to release to release a product as Dutch auction versus straight price? And do you, Tracy, have insights on the Panini Brain Trust considerations on refinements in distribution? I, I think Tracy, we got to get a sales guy on here to to handle some of these questions. Uh, you know, and if but, but I'll let you take it or not. Up to you. Um, I'm not privy to a lot of those uh, meetings, a lot of those discussions. I know there, there, there is a lot of thought and a lot of people uh, who contribute input to those decisions, whether it's, is this a fixed price auction? Is it Dutch auction? Or the, the uh, plans for future distribution developments. I'm not in those conversations, so I don't necessarily want to speak to them and be completely wrong, but I do think it would be, it would behoove and benefit the show if we could get one of our sales folks on because look, I mean, every facet of the business, our business, your business, everybody's business has escalated uh, radically over the last several months and but of all the people in our industry who've who've had their uh daily daily work lives kind of rocked our sales team maybe has felt that more than anybody because they have people coming out of the woodwork who hey i had a shop in 1990 i've got a liquor store i've got a gift shop um i want to become direct everybody wants to become direct now and it's like well, if we make everybody direct, then we get back to our original question of, are we going to have too much product? So it's a, there is a fine line to walk. I'm glad I don't have to walk it. I just have to promote our great products. So I've got one of the easiest jobs on the planet. Um, but I do think that's a great question. I'm not trying to deflect it, but I'm just not the guy to answer it. But we have some great, great veteran uh, uh Sales folks, DJ Kazmarek leads that group. Jim Stefano on the retail side, Kevin Hake on the hobby side, uh, uh, Billy Mayha on the international side, and Courtney Hetty, uh, in the, who deals with our hobby shops. And they they're they're experts, and I trust the decisions that they're going to make. Awesome. I did speak to DJ uh, during the industry summit, who did agree to come on the show. I just have to follow up and set a date, so. That may be a, a better uh, time to ask some of these questions that I know everybody wants to have answers about. Sure. Uh, Matt Chang asked a question about the Luka Doncic auto controversy. Are you in a position to comment about that at all, Tracy? Uh, I mean, I, not really, but I, I think, I think, um, I think. I mean, I don't really know how to answer other than than. The, Everything that that we've dealt with on Luca has been on the up and up, and they have uh, they've confirmed that he signed everything. So, so it's fiction for the most part. Yes. Yeah. Fair. Okay. Good. 
Um, Eric says, I just listened to a podcast with DJ and he went into great depth about it. A uh, really good guy. That's great to hear. Uh, Reppin says, you know, I totally agree with Gio. Would love to a super basic overproduced cardboard product for my kids with no chasers like Panini Complete Style. So yeah, you know, I, I think I think the hobby does crave something that doesn't, you know, SRM at, SRP at 100 bucks and automatically sells for 300. And may, maybe, you know, stickers are a good option for that kind of thing. But I don't think kids want the sticker. I think they want cards still. So, well, okay. That's I, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm glad you brought that up, though, because I think that's one of the biggest developments on our sticker collection over the last year is that we've added a card collection to the sticker collection as well. And so I think um, if you want kind of a best of both worlds type product, I think the the NBA and, and NFL sticker collections are definitely the way to go because they are affordable. They're, they're available and you do get and it's crazy because of these current market conditions. But the rookie cards in there of Joe Burrow or uh, uh, Zion or whatever are going through the roof. And the, the fact that you can get that rookie, that rookie card in a uh, 299 product is pretty phenomenal. So I give a, our sticker folks a huge tip of the hat for that idea of incorporating cards into the st st sticker collection because it's been wonderful. Awesome. Okay, man. Uh, Hockey Hockey says, would love to see Panini by the Skybox brand and release a set similar to the 9192. That that could be tough. I believe Upper Deck owns this. I know for a fact Upper Deck owns that. So <laughs> good, good, good luck with that one, Hockey Hockey. But uh, um, okay. Steve Menzi, the owner of the Sport Card Expo. Hi, all. Tracy, thanks much to you and DJ for Panini's support of the virtual Sport Card Expo. You guys seem to legitimately love doing what you do. Very nice, Steve. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ziggy says, I want to thank you both for taking these questions. Please understand I'm asking as a large collector of Panini products and fan of the hobby. Ziggy, no problem. And Ziggy, as, as we discussed offline, I'll filter some of your questions if I need to, but that's it. Not too many, Ziggy. I know you're well-intentioned. Uh, Tiger says, love the Panini products. Can you speak to the process of design? Is there a team of designers or say one designer or two responsible for specific products? Is there a specific research you perform? What can you tell us about design, Tracy? That's a great question. And I think that's another area of our business that's really improved over the last uh, handful of years. I, I, I think our, our products have always looked good, but our, our uh, graphic design team, it is a it is a, a large team. I think I want to say there's 10 to 12 ish on the, on the graphic design team. Uh, we have a creative director, David Tierney, who kind of uh, manages that group and they do great work. And uh, I think David Tierney will kind of switch up the assignment from year to year so that a, a, a design girl or get, a guy isn't doing hoops every year that they, they, they might do hoops one year. They might do follow us the next. Um, but it is a, a, a team of professionals who uh, r really have become specialists in the two and a half by three and a half inch medium. And their, their inspirational sources are many um, w whether it's movie posters or um, things they see uh, like in the fashion industry or, and the way a product kind of comes to life, there's the the product development team will host host a whiteboard meeting is what it's called. And they'll jot down everything about a product from how it did last year to uh, insert names, new ideas, things like that. And then they'll take that whiteboard, the notes from, from that into the kind of the initial meeting with production, with uh, design and all the all the teams. And that's where they'll start sharing those ideas. And that's when things start uh, being sketched on paper. And, uh, so, but, but, it, but the, the creative team is um, in, intricately woven in there and intimately involved in the process. And, and they've, they keep kind of raising the bar, whether it's something like Color Blast, which is beautiful. It's one of my favorite new inserts that we've done over the last year. Uh, two years. I think Kaboom is uh, a really special part of the industry now. Uh, downtown, things like that. They've really outdone themselves and I think they'll continue to raise the bar. 
Yeah, they've uh, definitely been thinking outside the box with some of those. I've always wondered, you know, with all the parallels in Prism, like, do you guys actually come up with designs and then get your stock vendor to create them? Like Tiger Stripe or those sorts of things? Um, I think that also is kind of a collaborative effort of, uh, hey, what can we do different or what can we do to, to push the bar? And then like a lot of times it doesn't even have to be somebody in product development or creative or marketing, but it could be anybody in the company that it could be someone in accounting who sees something on TV or at the mall or in their mail and they'll say, Hey, can we do this? And the answer is always yes, probably. I mean, we'll try to do a lot of different things because it is about continuing to, to, to push the envelope, um, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, Tiger Stripe because Tigers, the Zebras, the new Dragon Scales. Um, I'm always interested to see what new colors and what new patterns are available. And I think now we have a few vendors who are kind of accustomed to how we do things and how kind of outside the box we think that they're, when they see things now, they're bringing them to us oh. saying, well, what about this? You know, and so it's, it is a lot of trial and error. And I love when, these big uncut sheets will come over in these big like cardboard boxes because it's usually a test rip of, of a new pattern or a new color or a new foil. That's cool. I appreciate that insight. Uh, Joe Perot says, uh, thanks for the gracious answer, Tracy. Appreciate your w perspective and willingness to engage as do I on behalf of everybody. Joe Perot goes on to say, I love Panini products. Chris West, good evening to you. Um, Ziggy has a question for you, uh, Tracy, about customer service. He wants to know, does Panini track customer service in terms of any uh, KPIs? They, they do. Um, I don't know what they are, but I know that customer service is run just like um, our other departments where, where there are key performance indicators across the board, whether that's number of phone calls made, number of emails responded to, number of car. I mean, one of the biggest KPIs, obviously, is how many redemptions are getting sent out. Um, from day to day and week to week uh, that I know that, you know, I've kind of feel, feel for, for any customer, any customer service department, because their job is pretty thankless. Um, and I think that, that our team is dedicated, they're passionate, they're hardworking, and they show up every day knowing that a lot of the calls or emails that they're going to get aren't going to be, the nicest that they'll see all day and they still tackle it. Because I think one of the things that going back to a, a topic that we've touched on in the past, a lot of those folks there are passionate about what we do as well and grew up collecting, have, have had redemptions of their own before they worked at, at Panini. So they understand the, the, uh, the predicament that, that it puts everybody in. And so they continue, they bring their, lunch pails and their hard hats and they get down to business and everything is tracked. I mean, the phone calls are tracked, email conversations are tracked. Uh, obviously redemption is being sent and being received. All that stuff is tracked. Okay, man. Thank you. Jay wants to say rest in peace to soccer legend, Diego Maradona. Hopefully Panini will release more Maradona cards soon. Darcy Ravlix has a suggestion for a basketball card, a booklet for basketball, legendary finals, 10 autograph card, like Lakers, Celtics, 1986, obviously a one-on-one. -on -one. He gives it a thumbs up because he likes his own idea. <laughs> Thank you, Dars. Thank you, Dars. I'll give him one too. I'll give him a thumbs up too. Yeah. Uh, the card hobbyist would love to see some retro score football designs in the optic format. RIP to Maradona. The new football prism looks amazing, says Eric Stefano. What do we have here? Uh, Gio says, Dennis Rodman is in so many products. Why is he hardly ever in a Lakers uniform? I'm pretty sure almost never in Mavs. It would allow changing up photos since he's in so much. Take that one back to the shop there, Tracy. That's a great point. That's a great point. Jay says, any plan to sign an agreement with Formula One like, like Tops has? I mean, look, Panini, if they've proven anything over the time I've been there is that they want, they want, the, they're not afraid to, to pursue licenses. And so I don't, I haven't heard any rumblings of a Formula One license, but nothing would surprise me if the, if I found out tomorrow that, oh, by the way, but 
I don't know of any plans. Usually by this point of the show, we're at the 50 minute mark, Tracy. Usually by this show, I'm like halfway through my notes. I mean, like, I'm at like the 10% mark. I haven't even been able to look at them really. The, the viewers have just been firing away here. So, and they, they continue to. So we'll keep on going, but soon enough, we'll, we'll turn to some other topics. But um, Ziggy has a feedback from Collector to Panini. I'm just going to read this one. I feel like you are overusing the insert and devaluing the card. I love the Color Blast and bought one in Spectra. Not, nope. Not color blast is in draft prism. Same with downtown. Not sure I understand the end there, but hopefully uh, you and the team do. Ro yeah. uh, hockey, hockey said, tells us Rodman barely had a cup of coffee with the Lakers. It that's never stopped the card company from putting a variation, a maybe. There. Hey, it, it'd be a variation, right? Yeah, that's a good idea. There you go. Tiger Jordan says, very interesting. I believe the design quality of your products are big contributors to recent to the recent boom and success of our industry. Wow, that's a, that's high praise. High praise. Uh, when he thinks of Rodman, I think of Pistons, Bulls, and to a lesser extent, the Spurs. I think of Pistons and Bulls, and that's about it myself. Sean Robb, welcome. Does Chronicles allow Panini to keep alive brands like Marquee in case you need to produce a Marquee set in the future? I mean, that's a great point, and that's one of the the real beauties, the, the hidden beauties, because because not a lot of people would think along those terms like Sean is, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, and it's also Chronicles is another one of those products. that when we first started it, I mean, it was a little bit different than it is now, but it was one that, that we had to kind of go back to the drawing board on because the initial pass wasn't warmly embraced. And then when they did the reboot of it the next year in basketball and in baseball again, I mean, it's spectacular. I look, it's one of my favorite products because it's so diverse and you can, open a pack of eight cards, whatever it is, six cards, and you get six different brands and you get three or four different printing technologies. And uh, so that's a great point. And I love Chronicles. Yes. Cool, man. Cool. All right. Chris West, your question is part of the Sports Cards Live 5. So we're going to get to that at the end of the show, which is, I'll just put out there, he, he wants to know what is one thing you wish you could change about the hobby, but don't answer that, uh, Tracy. We're going to get to that later. Uh, Reppin wants to know, how do you decide what products get on-card autographs versus sticker autographs? Is this something you can speak to? Um, I don't decide that, but I, but our product development team does. And I think, um, you know, I think they probably look at a bunch of different factors. I think they look at uh, past performance. I think they look at um, uh, the value equation. I think they look at what can we, uh, uh, what can we pull off? Because as, as many people know, a lot of our products will have both on-card and sticker sticker auto so i think there's a lot of a lot of factors involved in that i'm i'm gonna take a stab at it. i'm gonna say it has to do with autograph availability yeah. like do you have stickers on on site right now or not uh price point of the product they're going into likely yeah. is, is one of them and also the time horizon between you know uh pre-production planning and actual release of the product how much time do you guys actually have exactly to, yeah. to gather the autographs okay Ed Seat, welcome to the show. Says Panini should make a Legends of the NCAA with cut autos of all greats in all sport. Lots of suggestions here and some great ideas from, from people. So, you know, hopefully uh, some of these stick out to you and maybe you take them back to the creative team. Yeah. Uh, hockey, hockey, any word on if Panini will release a Black Lives Matter card? That's an interesting question. Well, that's a great question. I don't I don't know what our guys have planned or, or in many cases what photos will be selected for certain cards. Um, so... Keep your eyes peeled. I, I would be cool. I kind of hope we do. Yeah. Joe says, does Tracy communicate with other marketing directors of other major brands or do competitors keep to themselves for understandable reasons? I, I like that question. That's a great question, Joe. Um, I don't communicate with other marketing directors of, of other uh, manufacturers. I have um, used to have many friends and still do have some friends who work uh, with the other companies, love catching up with them, love seeing them. And, uh, uh, look, as I said in the very beginning, the relationships and the people are what make anything ru run. And uh, there's a lot of great people at the other companies for sure. Chris West says, my reaction is Rodman played for the Lakers and Spurs. <laughs> <laughs> Ziggy says, do the Immaculate Blockchain Redemptions include physical copies? The Immaculate, the ones in product, they do not have physical cards with them. Thank you. Mr. LAGN, please bring back Panini NBA status. There's another uh, vote for a product. Stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned. 
Uh, all right, uh, Luke says, good evening, gentlemen. I just wanna say I've been enjoying the inserts lately, commemorating moments in time in NFL history. I'm in the middle of completing the treasured moment set from NT. Good luck to you on completing that set, Luke. Nice to hear from a collector talking about collecting. That's I awesome. Love it. That's I awesome. Love it. Uh, Ziggy wants to know, did Panini grab any logo man mask patches in the bubble? Who was responsible for chasing that down? Well, there, I don't know if we did, but for something that specific, I would, I'm going to give you a guy's name, Joe Reyes, who uh, is one of our many basketball acquisitions guys, Joe Reyes or Katya Winslow probably would have been involved um, if they did uh, track that down. And uh, Brian Bain is the guy that kind of runs that whole acquisition department. And like so many of our other departments, the acquisitions teams are, are smaller groups of two or three people working on basketball, working on football, working on baseball, uh, NASCAR. Uh, uh, um, I'm trying to think uh, soccer and, and other sports. So, I don't know if we did secure that exactly, exactly uh, the mask NBA logo man, but if we did, that's another version of a logo man that we absolutely would do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, to Uncle Vinny and Matt Chang asking about these guys bringing back brands of hockey. They don't have a hockey license right now, so um, but we are going to talk about hockey a little bit later in the show. Uh, hockey says Panini and Topps rivalry boardroom rivalry sounds as intense as Sportsnet on T <laughs> Sportsnet versus TSN. Those are the two Canadian sports uh, networks. Yeah. Um, Ziggy wants to let people know the status is available overseas. You can buy it on eBay now. Pretty affordable. Okay. I'm just going to throw Geo says if addressed previously, sorry, but how can a silver prism Kobe auto get the same single Get the same single pack as a hoops auto base prism as NT. I mean, we're just not going to get into that right now, but Geo, uh, but thanks for the question. And Ed the Sun, glad to have you here. Okay, for the first time, we're at the bottom of the comments. I'm thankful for that right now, Tracy, because I do have some things that I wanted to chat with you about. One of them is, and this is sort of, it's another sales issue, but you know, I, pro I, I let you know that I was going to ask you this one. So I'm going to put it out there because people want to know Canadian distribution. You know, I've heard uh, some of the LCS owners up here uh, express that they can't get product. People are people are coming into the um, into the stores and they don't have the products to uh, to sell them. What can you tell us about what's going? And I had one comment come through today that said, "Why did Panini? I forget the word he used, but basically opt out of selling to Canada." Uh, that that one I don't know. I know that all of our all of our hobby products are just distributed in Canada through the, the two Canadian distributors, uh, Grosner and, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank now. Grosner. Universal. And, uh, Universal. Sorry, distribution. Angelo is going to kill me and he could because he's got MMA uh, background. So Angelo, please forgive me. Don't kill him. Uh, Angelo. Don't kill him. Uh, so, so all of our hobby products are distributed there. And then on the retail side, I believe Echo and MJH distribute to Walmart Canada, um, but uh, Canadian distributors, like all of our all of our distributors, are subject to allocation of all of our products. And um, right now, there's just not a, like if everybody had what they wanted, the value wouldn't last very long. And the um, so I think more 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 demand than supply is a good equation. I don't know kind of what what uh, the exact balance should be, but I know that our sales team um, every year will uh, reevaluate the, the allocations and, uh, and if they need to make adjustments on it, they will. And again, that's something they don't take lightly, like the, because they're hearing the same calls, but times a thousand and getting the same email. So they, they look at that as a very serious issue and they will devote the proper attention to it. Um, but one thing in talking to Kevin Haig, he recommended that that every shop uh, should apply to Panini to be a direct store, and that um, that that could in, uh, increase the possibility of getting product to become a roundtable shop. And that application is available on our website, and uh, and you're obviously free to do that as a shop owner. 
Okay. So so the, the message is shop owners apply to, to buy direct from Panini. Canadian shop owners apply to buy direct from Panini might increase your chances of, of getting more product in your store. I mean, I know, I know we'd like to see more uh, up here in Canada. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, and I apologize to the anonymous Facebook user who didn't want me to, to skip over his question. So I'm just going to throw this up here. I'm not sure who this is, but Tracy says, I really love Panini instant brand, but the cards are of low quality. Any chance at reviewing the quality of this particular product? I'm not familiar with it. So I, so I Panini instant is our real time uh, product for lack of a better phrase. And so it's, um, uh, NBA draft, we did NBA instant or yeah, NBA instant cards in real time of each of the draft picks. And the this Sunday's NFL superstars will have cards available on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday uh, the following week. And those are actually printed in house using a special printer. So the quality, we, we do look at that. We are aware that in some cases the quality is not what our uh, traditional uh, uh, production facility produced product is, but I know David Sharp, who's kind of a uh, running point on the Panini Instant line for all sports, is constantly looking at that and, and trying to get the best uh, quality possible with the, the tools that he has. Okay. Well, I mean, if you can take one thing about that question, I mean, maybe, you know, raise it. No, good. Yeah, I, th I think that's, I think it's a, it's a, a, a a valid point, a valid point. Okay, I wanted to bring up uh, this question here from Jordan. He wants to know, Tracy, what marketing campaign or accomplishment are you most proud of during your time with Panini and why? And if you want to put this on the back burner, if you have to think about it, we can do that. I'll leave it to you. What do you think? That's a great question, man. That's um, uh, So I'm going to throw out a... I'll throw out one that just is top of mind. The first yeah. one that hit me was the 2014 World Cup campaign uh, we did. I believe it was 2014 with uh, that we did with Andrew Luck and with Kobe Bryant, and we we um, had a commercial series of those two kind of as kids because they both have international backgrounds, grew up appreciating soccer before they became basketball royalty and. NFL superstar, they were soccer players who collected the Panini uh, World Cup soccer stickers. And so the the opportunity to be able to work with those two, we shot the video in one day at StubHub Center. We had Andrew Luck in the morning and we had Kobe Bryant in the afternoon and their, their pass cross uh, for about an hour during that day. And the, the opportunity to just hear them talk and share stories and uh, was a real highlight for me. And then um, kind of a spur of the moment thing with all the production crew video and, and representatives from both athletes and my boss and his boss, uh, my boss, Jason Howard said, I want you to interview them together right now. And I was like, I, I don't, I don't have anything prepared. And, and he threw me in the fire and it, and it worked great, but it was not because of anything I asked. It was because of the interaction between those two guys and just the, the mutual respect that they had. And to think that we could bring them together because they grew up collecting FIFA World Cup soccer stickers um, is pre pretty phenomenal. So that's one that really stands out in my mind. That's a nice story, man. Nice story. Hockey Hockey says, once a card company hires Jeremy, we won't have access to this great quality content again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I they'd have to let me work from where I live, so I don't, I don't see it happening. Hockey, hockey, but I appreciate the comment. Okay, uh, Steve Menzi says, sounds like Canadian allocation may be akin to the electoral college vote compared <laughs> to popular vote. Who needs to and needs to be updated? Hey, possibly, possibly, yeah. yeah. Something for the sales team. Something for the sales Ooh, election. Team. Election humor. I love it. Yeah. Ziggy, no. Uh, halfway point check. 57 viewers. Amazing interview. We need to tip a few thumbs up for both, please. Be thankful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone down in the United States. And yes, you. if you haven't hit the like on this video yet, uh, please do. Even if you, you know, if you like it, I appreciate you hitting that thumbs up button. Even if you don't like the video, still hit that thumbs up button. I'll be okay <laughs> with that. I will be okay with that. Jordan says, Tracy, can you provide a sneak peek into what you are working on for 2021? Uh, you know, no, not right now, but <laughs> um, 
That's the short answer. I appreciate the question. Obviously, there's a lot of excitement going on. A lot of uh, a few pretty big things that that are being worked on right now that I I'm not really at liberty to to um, discuss right now. But uh, if you'll just be a little patient, um, you'll I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with some of the things we're going to roll out um, in the beginning of the year. So stay tuned. All right. All right. Um, what do we have here? Uh, another comment here about uh, Canadian allocation. I'll just read it out. Just, just uh, And the reason I, I do this, Tracy, is I really, you know, I don't know what's going on. You don't really, you're not in the sales department, but I just want to sort of emphasize what some Canadians are, are feeling and thinking. Matt says, allocation is understandable, but in Canada, some large hobby shops can't even manage to get a full sealed case of a product. They get single boxes only, despite their large sales volume. So obviously, there, you know, we got people pining for product here. Thanks for the comment, Matt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, Ziggy, thank you for loving the show. Much appreciated. Uh, Ed the Sun says, I'm very curious about the Kobe Bryant redemption packs. Very excited to see these as I am, I am one to possibly receive one. Well, good luck to you. I hope you do receive one. Sean Robb says, can you speak to Panini's marketing in European countries like France and Italy? I'd love to see Prism and Select Soccer catch more fire. Any uh, any comments on that, Tracy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Prism and Select Soccer, we would like to see them catch more fire too. Um, I, I know that uh, we we have so many subsidiaries of Panini across the country, and uh, we, we do talk with a lot of our uh, uh, counterparts in those places on uh, s- certain – products and certain marketing initiatives, but not probably as much as a lot of people might think. Um, but our our headquarters is in modern Italy and they've been producing FIFA World Cup stickers since 1970. And so they, they understand the beauty of the soccer fan. And we've seen huge growth on the soccer side uh, in China. So I think it's just a matter of time the the real the real question I have is a not as a as a card company guy but as a uh, as a collecting aficionado for years and years and years is what what a lot of folks do in Europe how they collect is way different than how we grew up collecting here in North America we didn't really ever do stickers at least I didn't and I don't think a lot of my people did they were available but we were trading card people and we bought packs and look for rookie cards. And then eventually we wanted memorabilia cards and autographs and things like that. And that's not how they do it in a lot of places in, in uh, Europe. So I don't know how it would translate, but I do know that universally when somebody sees a prism card uh, of any prism parallel or select parallel, they fall in love with it. So I think there's always a chance that in some of those uh, countries that don't really do trading cars like we do, I think there is a chance for, for a lot of growth. And then uh, obviously China, we've seen huge growth and, and all things. I mean, they've always been basketball uh, lovers over there, but the, the success of our soccer product over there really surprised me. Okay, man. Thank you. Uh, Ziggy wants to know, how does he get a job at Panini? He knows, the website, but seriously, let's chat. So Ziggy is serious about getting a job with Panini. Don't take mine, please. Yeah. Hockey Hockey says, would Panini ever consider releasing football basketball cards to McDonald's and or Tim Hortons? You know, up here in, in Canada, we can get hockey cards through Tim Hortons. So I think that's the question. I'll, I'll, you know, is that something that's that you guys have considered doing, some sort of restaurant type promotion? Sure. We've done things. We did a Taco Bell um, NBA promotion with Hoops probably eight, seven or eight years ago, we did a huge uh, Stanley Cup hockey promotion with Molson's uh, back in back in the early 20, 2011, 2012, something like that, that was uh, really successful. And I think now that trading cards are not just um, cool with us again, trading cards are pop culture, scorching hot, the thing to, or one of the few things that kind of everyone is on right now. I think that fact will will push a few of those initiatives maybe up up closer to the surface now. Okay, very cool. Ziggy says comments on upcoming eminence. Have you considered adding a VIP party ticket to high end product for the national? Uh, well, we've done VIP party tickets in past uh, 
iterations of the Eminence product. I think with Kobe Eminence, in fact, that was one of the uh, prizes. So, yeah, I mean, Eminence um, is another one of those things that when we first did it, and now the the year escapes me, maybe four years ago, we did the first one, and I thought we were crazy, like as a collector, not as an employee. As an employee, I loved it. As a collector, I'm like, whoa. And then to see the acceptance of it then was kind of shocking. So who knows how widely it'll be embraced at this time, but um, it's exciting. And it's like, I could never do that. If I bought a, a box of that, I would be um, on the street and my wife, I would come home and my clothes would be on the lawn and I would be looking for a new place to live. But and, and, and new clothes. Yeah, and new clothes. But it's but it is amazing. I mean, the the things we do to raise the bar from a graphic perspective and from a uh, technology perspective and just what is possible at the highest of high end trading cards. Our team continues to blow me away with what they do in products like Eminence. So I'm excited to see it. Yeah, it continuously blows me away when you know you see a, the high. I remember when the high pack price was, and I know we go back even further, but a hundred dollars yeah. was yeah. great. A hundred, 150 crazy. Next thing is four or 500. Now it's two grand. And, and I've, you've seen products for 18 grand. Like it, it, people have tolerance. In, in <laughs> they have money. Price, price. Yeah. Jordan has a couple of, uh, of, of questions here. Um, how has your job changed since COVID in March? Well, I mean, the, the easy answer is that I've been doing a heck of a lot more remotely um, and going into the office a little less. And it's really interesting, the, the whole, when the, when the COVID pandemic hit in March, I guess, and, you know, I think there was a lot of uncertainty, obviously, everywhere. But in our business, I mean, we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I think there was some trepidation, and, and there should have been. And a lot of walks of life have obviously suffered a lot more and it's tragic and it sucks. But um, we saw that maybe it, the fact that people were home uh, contributed to the growth of, of the trading card industry in the sense that you could get in on breaks from your living room in your underwear, as long as the camera was waist up or whatever. And um, so it's, so, so it was, it's been uh, another part of that mind boggling um, experience of the growth of trading cards. I think how they, they, they were received during the pandemic has been uh, extraordinary, but a lot of, uh, one of the things you come to realize really quickly is I'm sure we all have um, when you're not in the office as much, you miss the people that you grind with every day and seeing them on zoom is just different. And um, I miss a lot of my people, man, because they're they're what makes it so enjoyable to go in and you have exchanges of ideas and uh, differences of opinions and you get to talk about your favorite football teams and you get to talk politics, although I wouldn't necessarily advise that right now. But um, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of love that you don't get to you don't get to share when you're working from your computer. Yeah, you're a fortunate guy to get to really enjoy the people you work with. So. Um, lucky, lucky, lucky you are on that, on that point. Um, Ziggy says, can you talk about kids crate from Panini and what you are doing for kids? Uh, I, I can't only because I don't, I'm not real sure that I know. I, th I think, oh, kids crate. Okay. So I'm not as in the know as I should be on this. So Ziggy is one up on me. I, I think it is a new program we're developing really through Courtney Hetty, who works on our hobby shop side. Um, and I don't know much, but I'll say this. It, it is a way to get um, uh, cards into the hands of kids without them having to spend crazy money on them. And I, But in terms of the specifics of what's in the crate and when it'll start, I don't, I don't really know. But um, More info to come. More info yeah, to come. All right. for sure. Charles says, this is an important episode. I'm loving it. Thank you, Charles. Jordan wants to know, do you collect cards personally? If yet, who, what do you collect, Tracy? Oh, absolutely. Um, I grew up collecting. I've, I've been a, a pretty hardcore Bronco collector since probably mid-80s. And so I, 
I really collect Broncos stuff, a lot of John Elway stuff. Um, and then I love the, one of the things I love most about our football uh, de, uh, product development team is that in recent years, Rob Springs, who's our director of football product development, he does a phenomenal job and his team does a phenomenal job of getting these like 70s, 80s, 90s, kind of obscure, like cult following um, athletes and getting their autographs and their products for the first time in some cases and for the first time in many, many years in other cases. And he asked me, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, who, who I would like to see an autograph of in a product. And I said, Vance Johnson, who was a, a Broncos receiver, one of my all-time favorite players. And lo and behold, a few months later, we had Vance Johnson autographs in some of our products. And, and uh, so in recent years, it's been Vance Johnson. And just recently, Rob got uh, Carl Mecklenburg, the snow goose, um, into some products uh, with autographs. So those types of cards I love. I love the fact that we do that. I saw one the other day of – Oh man, it's maybe Wayne Corbett or something where I was just like, that's a cool autograph to add in a product because look, man, you get all the rookies you want. You got all the superstars you want, a lot of the star veterans, but to get those cult following type folks, the yeah, Christian Okoye's or um, folks like that for today's collector to be able to collect autographs of guys like that is, uh, I think is important. And I think it's cool that we do that. Yeah. Okay, man. Um, so here's a question. I didn't understand the first time, Gio, but I'll throw it up there for you this time. Uh, so first he says, I know that I skipped over it, which I did, uh, but it's a valid and important question. It may be. How can a lower end Kobe and a higher end Kobe auto redemption receive the same single pack? I still don't understand the question. Do you, Tracy? Um, it, it, it sounds like he may be asking about the the uh, Kobe Bryant redemption packs that um, we're doing to help to help those collectors who had Kobe redemptions that we're not going to be able to honor for obvious reasons. Um, and I don't know. Uh, I see, I get it now. Okay, sorry, uh, Gio. I get the question now. I mean, I don't really know how it's going to play out i did see a lot of positive responses to it when we unveiled the plan a few weeks ago um i think we just need to wait and see what uh how those packs are received and look man if we're limited on the number of autographs that we have and so we tried to make uh, the best of a really tragic situation and um i would just ask for patience as we see how it's going to play out fair fair man um, this next question, I, I don't understand it, but maybe you do. Tracy, All Time Greats blog says, hey, Tra can Tracy speak on retail solutions? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I I, I guess I can try. I, I uh, mean, a lot of... If you don't, do you understand the question? If not, I'll ask him to reword it and we'll move on in the interest of time. He, he's probably asking about the availability of product at retail and maybe how some products are not hitting the sh the shelves like they should. I, 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 I don't really know. I just know that's been a, po a popular topic of conversation in, in the hobby. Okay, fair enough. Uh, okay. Uh, BM, Brom wants to know, is there a continual relationship with Panini with Tmall in China or was this year with Select and Optic just a one-off thing? Just sad that we can't get access in getting those exclusives. Uh, there, there's an, it's an ongoing relationship. We have a T-Mall store and I think we're, we're making products exclusively for T-Mall store, um, or international distribution with a large part of that being on our T-Mall store. Um, I don't know what, uh, the entire product calendar looks like going forward, but I do know that they're experiencing a lot of the same, uh, problems that are, uh, a lot of the same issues that we're experiencing here with, uh, uh, not enough product to, to satisfy demand. Okay, man. So the, the comments keep pouring in, dude. And it's like, uh, so we're going to get, we're going to go through a few more and then I'm just going to, and I, I apologize to the viewers, but I want to get to some other things. So uh, your question just might not get, uh, make it to be in play as I like them all to be, but we'll see, we'll see how we go. Darcy wants to know who have you met athlete wise that wowed you? And let's keep you, let's do rapid fire now. Now, uh, Tracy. Oh man, Zion Williamson. Awesome. Ziggy No says 15 16 was the first eminence. Wiggins was the big rookie. This is John Zion. Okay, I think you're just talking to somebody else. Thank you, Ziggy. 
Matt says, curious on feedback in regards to the 2020 WNBA prison product from Panini's perspective and or what you are hearing from the hobby. Great question. It was on my in my notes. So we were going to do this one anyway. Again, take it away, Tracy, and let's try and uh, keep it as short as you can. It's been phenomenal. I mean, it, it's I think having the prism name on it helped. I mean, the, the Dahmer's product was uh, well received as well, but not like prism. Um, I think obviously having a rookie like Sabrina and SQ in there and with autographs and prism uh, uh, parallels has been phenomenal. And again, to give our hats off to our product development team, they, they did their research and due diligence in getting not just the, the current stars and the rookie class coming in, but they also went back and got the legends as well. And uh, it's been a spectacular success for us. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it. Great. Awesome. Jake S says, who are some players in the big four? I'll say the big four sports because hockey's in there too, that you like from a marketing perspective, from a collector's or employee's perspective. Thank you. Um, you know, I think there's quite a few and I think you see us working with a lot of them. Um, it seems like every year now, uh, players are becoming more cognizant of the fact that they, they're, they're, best representation for their personal brands and they they they're professional and they work well with companies and they get it and we also never want to use players that just aren't into it like meh like we want people that are as passionate about our products maybe as if not as passionate as we are at least passionate about what we're doing and why we're doing it and i think you see us working with players like that i don't even need to name them you see them um, it, in our in our results with what we're doing marketing wise. Okay, thank you, Jordan Hagedorn says Tracy. Uh, thank, you. thank you for being the epitome of a great hobbyist and what's good in the hobby. Appreciate the energy and authenticity you bring to this awesome industry. Much love, brother. Thank you for the nice comment, Jordan. Thank you, brother. It's good. To, thank you. Ziggy says, I know my panini. Thank you for, I know my panini, which Ziggy does. He says, thank you for doing Kids Crate. Looking forward to it. Hope they can register once uh, once they can, I suppose. Uh, he goes on to ask, Tracy, do you ever secretly meet meet a tops person and trade sports cards in the Dallas area? <laughs> no, no that's, I don't think that's ever happened. Uh, the, the only real person, I knew like two people I was close to at tops. One, Susan uh, Lajuda who is no longer with Tops, but she's great. And then Clay Laraski, I've known for, since I got into the into the industry, and he's a great guy and, and uh, love him to death. I just don't talk to him anymore. Fair, fair. Jordan says, Jeremy and Tracy, what's your favorite Panini product from 2020 and why? I'll start by saying I don't have one. I, I, I don't find it up here. Tracy, <laughs> just being honest. Tracy, no. what about you? Uh, 20 favorite 2020. Well, it's probably going to be a football product. I'm going to say so far. Uh, I mean, I really like origins so far. Um, but I think next week's release of prism is going to be off the charts. And I'm always one of my favorite products that we make year in and year out is playbook football. Um, and I just, I think we're doing that for 2020. I should know that, but I'm, I'm a little sketchy on the details, but so origins right now, but that could change the prism next week. And then if playbook is out, I'm all in on playbook. All right. Thank you for that. Ziggy. Thanks for uh, smartening me up that the big three is actually a basketball senior leagues in the USA. If that is in fact the case. Okay. Let's move on. I'm, I'm going to, we're, we're at the bottom of the comments. I might just not take any more. Because just in the interest of time, everybody, but thank you guys have been awesome. Lots of lots of comments, lots of questions. So thanks for uh, for your interaction, everybody. Okay, let's talk a little bit now, Tracy, about um, one in one basketball, a new product that released today. You know, anything noteworthy about the product that you want to share? Um, I just think it's the first time we've done it in basketball. We did uh, one football that that was uh one card slab autograph and it was a, the first time really that that we've done a one card product and i i think to go with the the one in one kind of free throw analogy in basketball we added a second card to it um all the hot rookie autograph stuff from jaw and 
uh, Tyler Hero and Zion and those guys. Uh, it, I think that mix with uh, a lot of the biggest superstar and legendary guys too. So it's just new today and uh, it's something we haven't done before. So it could be cool to, to check out. All right. Good luck with that product. Um, let's talk about hockey and the hockey license, uh, or the lack thereof, and the fact that you had one for a few years in the early uh, 2010s. So first question, when Upper Deck's current exclusive expires, will Panini be pursuing a license? It's a great question. Um, obviously, I have no insight into that, but I, all I know is that Panini – has never shied away from from adding um, assets to the the arsenal. So um, that that's what I do know about Panini, um, regardless of what license we're talking about. So, uh, but we we have a a, a proud but brief uh, past in hockey. I probably wouldn't know Chris Barr if we didn't uh, make hockey cards. So, if nothing else came out of that that run it's uh i got to meet chris barr and be a, be a co-worker and uh, call him a friend so that's a that's a good a positive development and chris barr has been on sports cards live before and uh he does have a history in, in the in the world of hockey for sure so you know hockey cards or hockey card collectors are very passionate yep. um did you guys, when you were doing hockey, when you would come up to the Toronto Expo, when Panini had a presence there during during your license time, did you guys recognize that, just how passionate the Canadian and the hockey card collector is? Oh, instantly. I mean, like, I worked at Beckett before. I worked alongside Al Muir. And so I knew the kind of reader's right mail he would get from hockey collectors. And I was, I would always look at that. I was kind of envious that we did, because it just seemed like the level of of uh, sophistication as a collector was at a higher level. And so, um, and that was in the mid nineties to late nineties. And then when P P uh, Panini landed a hockey license and we finally got the chance to really interact in on, on Canadian turf with the collectors, it, it was just um, obvious and it was instant how passionate um, and how, uh, educated the collector was up there and just hanging out with some of those folks at the uh, Toronto Expo. That's still one of my favorite shows that, that I ever got the chance to attend was the uh, Toronto Expo. It's just a great vibe and uh, passion and positivity really too. I mean, it's not just passion and uh, sophistication. There's a lot of positive energy and a welcoming environment anytime we went up there. Okay. No, appreciate that, man. I mean, we, it was nice having you there when you guys could make it. And, uh, we are, we are a proud bunch, you know, we, and we do, we do love our hockey. Uh, Ziggy, Ziggy wants to thank you both for happy Thanksgiving to everyone in the chat and watching. Thank you, Ziggy. Uh, Jake S says, um, not a fan of unlicensed cards. So big three really is soccer, basketball, and football for me in U S of a, I'd say for Panini. Fair, Jake, but Jake, I mean, you know, don't don't have blinders on. Uh, you know, Upper Deck does have a hockey license and makes some some pretty great cards. And um, and you know, there's like 32 teams in the league. So, uh, but hey, collect as you will, collect what you like. I'll never fight anybody on that. That's for sure. Um, and we have here Alec. Just wanted to let you know that I really appreciate everything that you bring to the hobby community. Cheers, Jeremy. I don't. I think he's talking to me. Maybe you, Trey. No, he's talking to you for sure. Thank, thank you, Alec. I, I greatly appreciate those kind words. I truly do. Thank you, Alec, very much. Let's talk a bit about the roots of Panini, Tracy. This is something that you know. I'm a guy who loves. I love the hobby. I love cards. I collect as much as anybody else does. But I'm also really interested in the history of the hobby. I, I'm fascinated by it to the to the point where I collect hobby historical items. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, Panini, you know, it's a funny name for a card company in the United, in, in North America. Sure. Tell us a little bit about how the company originally started. Well, P the Panini name is a family name. It's a, uh, and there were brothers in 1961 who worked for a newspaper distribution uh, chain or, or, or company. And they, they had the, uh, they came across these soccer stickers called uh, uh, they call them 
calciatore, which is Italian for f- a football player, meaning um, international football, not North American football. So they they came up with the idea to use these soccer stickers with their newspapers to help sell newspapers. And before long, uh, the s- stickers were were more popular than the newspapers. And so a k- time of business was born, a family business was born. And um, what, nine years later, they, they had secured the exclusive rights to FIFA World Cup stickers. And they've been uh, uh, just a gargantuan force um, in the world of s- soccer stickers and collectible stickers. And now it's, I mean, it's all over the, all over the globe, literally. And it's just, a, a, it's huge. So, I mean, it's interesting that it was literally, they were trying to sell newspapers. They, they started doing stickers and then the, it, it, it's the same thing as in cards, right? They so they added cards to gum and candy and cigarettes exactly. to sell those things. And now the cards or whatever, no one cares about the, the rest, right? <laughs> can't even get the gum anymore. And boy, do I wish we could, because I loved that gum back in the 80s. Yeah, for sure. No, you're right. It's, it's, uh, and it's, look, when, when Panini came into the North American market as a trading card, uh, entity back in 09 or 10 or whatever it was. I think a lot of it obviously shocked the establishment. It shocked a lot of people in North America, myself included, because th- there was never any uh, inkling that, that somebody other than at the time, top stripper deck would have basketball. And um, so it took a little bit of, I mean, it was a little, it was quite shocking. Actually, I worked at Beckett at the time and was trying to cover the story. And I, I had to gather my bearings after I first heard it because I just, I didn't even fathom it was a possibility. I remember the, the, I remember when it was announced, Matt, and I remember the hobby was so fearful that there were going to be no more basketball cards. There's going to be (laughs) stickers and people were panicking. They were, they were, they were unhappy with the decision that was made by the NBA at the time because they legitimately feared for the existence of new basketball cards. Yeah, Thankfully, Panini did their research and came into the North American market and gave the cus- the consumers what they wanted. So that that fear was short lived. But that was that, that was funny, man. I, I remember that pretty well. Yeah, yeah, I, I do too. I just remember the the comments on the on the Beckett stories I would write and just the gnashing of teeth and the pulling out of hair of uh, our market is gone. And that was never the plan, right? I mean, they were always going to do. North American trading cards as North Americans had come to uh, expect over over a hundred years. It was just the to to connect that this Italian company that makes stickers is going to be a trading card manufacturer. It took a little bit for that the, those two thoughts to meld in a lot of minds of a lot of collectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, quick question from Ziggy wants to know if I've been buying any uh, Upper Deck Series 1 hockey, ripping any. Sorry, just had to ask. Ziggy, uh, I haven't yet. I've gone into uh, one of the LCSs that is right near where I work, and uh, he was sold out. So, um, no, I haven't. Uh, he also wants to know, Tracy, where can Jeremy get a shirt or hat to wear and give to his viewers? I love that. Ziggy's, see, Ziggy's wrangling <laughs> swag for me here. And I so- say that. I say to people, Tracy, I should have asked you this a long time ago, but I say to anyone who comes on the show, if you send me a shirt, I'll wear it. And I didn't have a Panini shirt, so I, I couldn't wear one, but I would have had you sent me one. So Well, that's a done deal. Just when I'm back in the office next week, at least next Monday. So I need your address and I'll get you swagged up. I'll send you an email, brother. I appreciate yeah, that. I for appreciate sure. That. Charles says those 70s Panini hockey stickers were amazing, especially that Trechiak rookie. Uh, Jake says, are those Panini Mike Tyson stickers from 86 to 88, the same Panini? Yes, they are. Yes, they are, Jake. Uh, Paul misses playoff contenders hockey. The auto rookies are some of my favorite cards. Hockey Hockey says the Panini is named after the sandwich and that Panini sandwiches are the best. (laughs) Not true, but thanks for throwing that. Thanks for throwing that out there. Here's a question from LeBron that kind of going back to a why question, but why aren't there any second year Luca autos? And I, I mean, I haven't fact checked that obviously, but uh, if you, we can skip, like if you don't have an answer, we can just keep on going. I don't know. I did, I, I wasn't aware of that either. So uh, I need to do some research on that myself. Alec, I'm glad to hear that uh, here in Melbourne, the hobby is, community is absolutely crazy. I'm in the state. He's in the stage of organizing a card show. Good, Good luck. 
from from what I saw in the news last night, Australia is handling COVID in a very efficient and effective manner. So you guys may be fortunate. That's where we can all go for card shows, everybody. We go to <laughs> Australia for card shows. But when we get there, we're going to have to isolate for two weeks. So you're going to have to take some time off work and uh, plan ahead. That's another market, too, that where the people are just phenomenal. I mean, we've I've been able to kind of um, uh, develop a few relationships with a lot of Australian uh, collectors, a lot of mates, if you will, who I would never, uh, at least as of yet, have had the chance to meet in person, but have great correspondence with. And the passion um, and the positivity that they bring uh, are are off the charts. Wonderful. Ziggy says, uh, Tracy, sincere thank you. I appreciate your time tonight and all you do for the hobby. I look forward to meeting you in person one day. And he probably looks forward to maybe being a colleague of yours at work one day, too, if you uh, <laughs> get the job with you guys. Um, okay. Uh, Hershey Cards jumps in and says, I think Luca has an exclusive deal with Fanatics now. Need to fact check that. So there's some. there's a possible answer right there. That could be why. <laughs> so... I want to go to one more sort of, I don't want to call it a controversial issue, but it's an issue that that I that exists in the hobby. It's, it's existed since we started seeing patch cards, or not, not right at the beginning, but early on. And it's got to do with the fraud that exists when a collector takes a patch card that might be one or two boring colors, takes the patch out, puts in a fancier patch that is not, you know, not as originally manufactured, and sells it on eBay or whatever, posing as an original card. This is this is not good in our hobby. We don't like it. It's been something that I've been advocating against and trying to find solutions for since around 2006, 2007. Patch fraud issue. And, uh, you know, is it on your, is it on Panini's radar, Tracy? Is it something that you guys are concerned with? And, you know, that an image database, uh, invisible markings. I've heard all sorts of stories. Do you know, can you speak to this? What is actually happening when it comes to fake patches? Well, I can tell you what, what I know kind of anecdotally is that I, I, I that, that was, uh, it seemed to be a bigger issue like earlier in the decade. And I don't know that it's, um, I don't know that it's persisted at that level, but I do know that, every memorabilia card that we make, whether it's a one color swatch or a six color patch jumbo thing, they're all handmade. Um, every one of them. And, and if you go back, we talked about some of the YouTube videos earlier uh, in the show. If you go watch those, you'll see there's a lot of uh, uh, how they do that or making of videos. And one of the things we do with our memorabilia cards with everyone, it doesn't matter the player, the sport, the color, the the patch, or whatever. So it's all kind of estimated and measured for, for whatever product it's intended for. And there's uh, the, there's an adhesive that's placed on the back, and that adhesive uh, has a uh, unique code that is only going on that card in that set. So. I wouldn't recommend anybody destroy their memorabilia cards, but if you were to, or you ever suspected something, you take that that swatch off the card, and the back of it will have the the player name and a, a unique number that that is um, that is tied to that jersey, and, and we can track then where that jersey came from when it was uh, acquired, when it was first cut, what products it was cut for. We can do all those things with that number. So you can't see it. Um, but I promise yeah. you, it's, but I promise you it's there. And if you, if you have a, I've done this before to, to check our own stuff. Um, I've taken a one color white Jersey swatch car. There's a guy that, that I don't want to call an afterthought because people love him, but it was a card I could afford to test and I peeled it off and sure enough, it was there. Um, so, I mean, to me, though, Tracy, it sounds like a very risky way to find out if your patch <laughs> is real, right? Because if, if, you have a, if you have a beautiful patch, you're not going to take the risk of removing no, that no, patch no. to see if it's legitimate, yet you're going to question its authenticity. What, you know, and this isn't really a question. It's more of something to take back to the shop that I would recommend as, a, as someone, again, who's been kind of battling these fake patches. I started, I started 
assembling our image archives back in 2006 for important cards from Upper Deck's Cup brand, just as an example. And, you know, and that archive became a reference point for a lot of people over the years. Um, I stopped doing it because, you know, time becomes, you know, time time is, uh, is, is, uh, is limited. But, you know, an image archive to me is the only way to do it where you don't have to destroy the card to find out. Um, yeah. Although I've heard the Panini, you could shine a light through it and maybe see it that way too. So if there's any validity to that, that may be an alternative solution. But I want to, I want to suggest to you and to Panini to find a way to take photographs of every, now I don't know if it's got to be every single patch card that is made, but at least the RPAs, the rookie year auto, the rookie year patches as well. Mm-hmm. The ones that you know are going to command value down the road. I think that that's in the interest of the hobby. And it would also show the hobby. And I'm not just saying this to Penny. I'm saying this to all the card companies. It would show the hobby. It would show the collector community that the card companies have a vested interest and are well aware of the values our collections may hold down the road. Because yeah. it's understandable to think that the card companies are, wor- are, you know, you guys need to meet annual budgets. You are worried. About, you, 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 you are you are interested in your performance on a year to year basis, but the collectors we're buying cards, we're holding them for extended periods of time. So if I buy a card for a thousand dollars today, I want to know that 10 years from now, this era won't be looked back on as the fake patch era. And that any card from that era will be questioned because it may be fake if it's too nice. That is no good for collectors. It's no good for the hobby because longevity is important for all of us. And with that in mind, I say it to you, I say it to all the card companies, might cost a little bit more money and maybe we'd be willing to pay for that through through increased pack prices. I don't know, I would, but I'm not gonna speak for everybody. But I think that's an important thing for the hobby, for the long-term value of our collections that we invest now. And now the the the, the amounts we're, we're spending on our collection, also known as investing, are higher than they've ever been. So I think it's more important now than ever for the card companies to have an, a verification process in place for collectors to verify whether their patch is authentic. Similar to the way you can type, you can you can type in uh, into a PSA app or maybe yeah. a Beckett app, even the serial number on a PSA slab to see if it if it's real. That's something that that I ad, I'm advocating hard for. I think it's important. Um, I know people that have collected patch cards going back several years that just stopped because they they don't trust. They they're just not willing to take that risk anymore. So, I you know I say it with the best intentions and I say it you know pretty aggressively right now. I recognize that Tracy, but it's because I'm saying it you know on behalf of the hobby. If I can do that, which I'm going to, whether other people want me to or not, I'm going to anyway. And um, and I say it because it, it's important and I'm invested and so are so many others. So I'll leave it at that for now, but thanks for letting me get on my soapbox with that no, one. No, no, I appreciate it. I mean, we do we do take it seriously. I know in, in some instances in the past, we have gone to uh, high-risk photography of, of all uh, key cards, but a lot of those things, quite frankly, we deal kind of in one-offs when when a complaint or an issue is brought up from the community, we try to investigate and go down that trail to find out for for the the community what what's legit and what's not. But it, but to my earlier point, it's not something I I sense that we're getting as much of as we did earlier in the decade. But I but I may be wrong about well, that. And you you know why you might not? It's because um and this is just the fact of the matter is that. You had a hockey license in the early 2010s, earlier on in the decade, and hockey patches are just way nicer than any other sports. I mean, there's way more colors, way more patterns. Basketball patches are boring at best. Football <laughs> patches are, you know, some, well, actually, I have a really cool football patch here that, that I got from uh, I got from the Beckett Industry Summit, which I was going to show during card of the day, but I'll show it right now that they're talking about it. And I told, and some people have seen this before, but I, I believe I got, I think this is one of the better cards that Panini donated to the Beckett Industry Summit for attendees to receive. And I think I was like the first person that registered for that conference. And I think that's why I ended up with this card, maybe this Josh Ooh, Allen yes. logo, game Beautiful. worn. Yeah. Beautiful. So I that's was super, awesome. I was super pumped when I opened this from the swag box and saw this and I like, whoa, like. What does the back of it say? It says the enclosed game worn slash used material is guaranteed by Panini America Inc. Yeah, because we 
we had a, a, a team deal with the Bills, and we got uh, some just filthy Josh Allen stuff in. So that that's actually a set that Scott Prucci, who I share an office with, one of my best buddies of all time, he put that set together. But I didn't even know he was doing it until I saw a few of the finished cards, and I'm like, wow. So, yeah, that's a great card, dude, especially for a, or a, a, a Canadian, Canadian guy, right? Yeah. Do you remember this card? Like, Do you remember laying eyes on this one? Well, not that specific card, but I saw some some images of a few other players. Okay. And, it, and I was blown away by the whole set, but that's a great yeah. card of a I great think, quarterback too. Yeah, I was very happy with this one for sure, for sure. Um, okay, a couple more comments. Uh, and then, you know, I did want to – let me just get to a couple quick comments here. Uh, they're both by Ziggy. He says – Ziggy's on fire tonight. I have I have volunteered to be Jeremy and go to Panini to take photos of all NT football and basketball RPAs for a digital catalog. I will do it for free if you help me get access. And what he's referring to, Tracy, I believe, is that back in 09, I got to go to Upper Decks pack out for the cup. Mm. And I took pictures. I, I volunteered and they took me up on it. I went down, I went to their facility in North Carolina and I photographed 28,000 patch cards from Upper Decks, the cup that year. And have, have those images and that and I, so i proved it can be done i did it i proved that you can take and capture images of all the patch cards in a high-end brand mm -hmm. i've been there done that have the experience happy to talk about it um ziggy says at sports cards live we discussed this with the panini pm in july and he said he would let me volunteer for all ntrpas we have it on video just need tracy to back us i'm serious about doing it so who wouldn't want to go to a pack out, right? Ziggy, I, don't think that. I wanted to, and I think I'm one of like two. I know Chris Barr got to go to one before he worked at a card company as well. We might be the only two non-employees that got to go do these things. And trust me when I say I feel privileged to have had that experience. Let's quickly talk a bit about sort of state of the hobby. We've touched on how crazy it is, Tracy, but the rise of the six digit and seven digit modern sports card. I mean, it's it's crazy. How close does the executive at Panini and even the executive at headquarters in Italy, how close do they watch the secondary market? And as a double-barreled question, and I've been coached not to ask double-barreled questions, but I will this one time. It's a little bit different. What's the importance of the auction houses like Golden Auctions, who has sort of gone, you know, kind of wandered from the traditional auction house strategy of vintage cards and he's really, Ken is really out there pimping these modern sports cards. And we're seeing seven digit sales now. We've seen like three of them that I can think of off the top of my head. And a couple that have come close hitting that, you know, $900,000 mark. But not only seven digit, but six digit modern day card sales. So again, does the executive watch the secondary market? Number one, and number two, what, what, how important are the, uh, is a golden auctions to what's happening right now? <clears throat> So very fair questions. I can say that um, at least as far as I can can ascertain from where I'm at in the marketing department, I don't think our executive team really uh, fixates on the secondary market values until something pops up in the news about a card selling for something. Because um, I just don't think that's, that's uh, what motivates them, right? It's because no matter what a card sells for, I mean, it's yes, it gets headlines and and it it, it brings buzz to the industry. But I mean, we want to make sure that that people are getting the value that they think they deserve out of any product, whether it's hoops or eminence. Um, so I think that's our. If people are happy, I think that's our that's the number that we look at. Um, but but yeah, when those when those big sales pop up. I mean, it's it does create a lot of buzz in the office because everybody, not just internally, but everybody around us is talking about those numbers. And uh, so I think it is something that we look at and we express um, interest in and surprise about. But it's not something that we now I, I don't know this. I'm sure there are some uh, geeks and I use that term affectionately. We're in our office. Earth. We're right. a bunch of cardboard nerds, Tracy. It's all right. Yeah, we are, no doubt. Nerds I'm, and proud. I'm a I'm the fan club uh, secretary or something. But <laughs> um, but I'm sure there are people who, on their own, 
time will track certain things because that a lot of our product development folks used to be price guide analysts. And so they're, they're, they're numbers people by nature. So I'm sure that happens, but in terms of like top level, top level executives or any uh, mid-level executives, it's not something that, that dominates our time or that we, we uh, look at and constantly track. Uh, to your question about the, the, the big auction houses and their role in kind of, uh, uh, making these modern era cards kind of maybe even bigger. I think, I think that's true. I mean, I think, uh, when they start going away from what has been their bread and butter for a long, long time, which is game worn memorabilia and vintage graded cards. And they're now going to vintage extremely modern cards. I think it speaks volumes about where the industry, at least right now, has moved. And I think they're, they've uh, been a big part of that movement. But I think it's almost like a what comes first, the chicken or the egg thing. It's like, are they moving that way because that's where their business is going? Or is the business going that way because they started showcasing those cards? And I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I, you know, we had big sales on eBay before uh, Ken Golden started really hustling that. But uh, yeah. so I, I think it, I think it goes hand in hand, though, right? Yeah. There's been a lot, a lot of forces in play here lately. Uh, to Matthew Jones, that was uh, discussed uh, very early in the episode. You can go back and watch that uh, later on. Um, Ziggy has another question that I, I want to know the answer to. Uh, what is Panini's proudest card in the hobby? He says, for example, Top Sprags about the Trout. Upper Deck has the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie. What would what would you do, do? You have a feel for this one, Tracy? What is the Panini's proudest card? I mean, uh, I could throw a couple options out there just to come to my mind. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're go ahead, the, I didn't mean to interrupt. The, the Luca RPA, yeah. the yeah. Zion RPA, those are important cards, even though they're only two two years less, two years old or or less. Mm -hmm. um, but is there anything that sticks out to you? The the, the Luca RPA immediately came to my mind when, because I think it, I guess it depends on what you're talking about. You're talking about like strictly value or iconic. I'm thinking iconic because you know the 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 Trout rookie the Tops did isn't the most valuable card by any means that they put out, but it, it's an important card. Yeah. The, the uh, the '89 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. rookie again, not the most valuable card Upper yeah. Deck made, but a very important card. What would be, uh, do you know, do you have a feel for what? Uh, well, I think it, it's probably something like the Luca RPA. It could be the Zion RPA or the Jaw RPA, but the, the one that immediately um, probably, it's been a while now, but the card that was the iconic card was the Blake Griffin RPA, right? From 0910 NT. I mean, that thing was off the charts. I mean, that was the Luca NTRPA before the Luca NTRPA. Now, obviously, it's it's softened quite a bit, but um, for the longest time, it was that that card. But I think you're right. I think something more like right now, uh, Luca or Zion slash Jaw. I think Ziggy throws out Ziggy throws out Giannis, which is the one that I just slip my yeah. mind but that, that's a that's a big one too jake throws out 12 13 prism mm -hmm. which is you know there's definitely merit to that comment for sure uh okay listen we are we we've got like seven minutes left typically speaking so we're gonna move on now to the what i like to call and i have branded as the sports cards live five now right. appearing on your screen so we're gonna get into five. These aren't necessarily rapid fire, Tracy, but you know, in the interest of time, let's go as quick as we can. Number one, what is your favorite card in your personal collection? So I've got a couple, but I but I brought one because it's one that I've had forever, and it's uh, this is a it's back when we used to use the the real gaudy stickers. I don't even know if you get you know what I'm gonna take it out of the I've got it in a a screwed out and a penny sleeve, but it's yeah. the the tw two thousand playoff honors. Uh, Pro Bowl souvenirs, John Elway autograph. You can see the sticker. It's one of the silver ones that kind of detracted from the overall appeal of the card. But the reason I love this card so much is because, A, I've had it for a long time. Um, I remember buying it at a Super Bowl show back in the day. And it includes the 
a piece of the Pro Bowl jersey that John Elway wore in his last football game ever, which was the weekend after Super Bowl 33. He played in the Pro Bowl, uh, started it, and that has a piece of the jersey in it. So that's the one I'm going with for now. But if you ask me tomorrow, it could be a different one. That's all right, man. That's all right. And you know what? Hey, I'm glad that you picked a card from your favorite team. You you are a diehard Broncos fan. So that makes good sense to me. Number two, what is the, your highest priority want card? Meaning one that is actually attainable. So, you know, not a Tito six Wagner. What is high, highest up on your want list right now? You know, I thought about this and I was going to give you some kind of Bronco answer, but I think if <laughs> the, a card that I could have, could have, could attain, um, would have to be something Zion, right? Like just because I, th- when you you work around these folks in any capacity, but if you get the chance to to learn about them or know them, you start falling in love with all these different people because they're cool or they get it or the Zion. I mean, if there's a a Zion affordable autograph I could get, and I will get one at some point, um, it would be him. Perfect. Question number three, where is your favorite place to buy cards? Man, we used to have a, a great shop here in Louisville, Texas called Bunt, Punt, and Dunk. And so I went to him for everything. Is it, what was it called? Bunt, Punt, and Dunk. Bunt, Bunt Punt, and Dunk. And that's, Ken, a, that's, a, that's a mouthful, man. Man, I know it. I loved it. Ken Green is the guy who owned it, who now, believe it or not, was – a substitute teacher for both of my kids when they were in middle school, which is such a great story because he got to tell them stories about me going into his shop all the time. Um, So anyway, he's not in business anymore, but that was my place to go back in the day. Now um, I try to save my buying for like the shows that I get to go to. um, And, and like SMP here in Grapevine has been, a great shop as well. So okay. that's good. That's good. That's good. I'm just going to bring up uh, Ziggy's comment here too. He says, uh, I would even say Mahomes and TRPA yeah. and contenders autos are, are iconic for football. Ed seats as a Jesse Owens cut autograph. Matthew Jones will watch the beginning after this ends. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew Jones. Joe did say anything Kobe eminence. So a couple of other, I, I like that these guys are throwing out, uh, yeah, throwing no, it's out great. The options. Yeah. Question number four, and this is the one that was asked earlier that we skipped because it was going to come later, which is now, if you could change one thing about the hobby, Tracy, what would it be? Um, I would say to embrace the positivity of, of any pursuit, right? Uh, I think there, there's enough cynicism and negativity all around us. And I think one of the things that I look for sports cards, I've always looked to sports card for is kind of a refuge or a diversion and uh, to really just uh, appreciate the, the positive aspects of the hobby. And that could be something as simple as a, a, a sweet photo or a funny sentence on the back of the card or a design. I, you know, I think there's so much that you can find positivity in if you just look and, and we're always going to have cynicism around us. We're going to be uh, products of that or, but I think if people can embrace the positivity more, um, I think we'd all be a little bit happier. Yeah, man. And I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I, I agree, you know, there, there's so much negativity in, 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 in many industries. We, we've got a lot of it in ours. It, it, it is the way it is. And, I think right now we're seeing a lot of it because COVID has just made everything slow down. Um, and, you know, on, on the, on the one hand, it's like, yeah, let's just be, po- let's enjoy the hobby. The hobby is supposed to take us away. It's a hobby. It's a, it should be a hobby. It's supposed to take us away from everyday life, you know, issues and challenges that we all have to just get by and pay our bills and all this. So I hear, I hear it there on the other side. And I'm not, I'm not really trying to devil's advocate, but I will just say that, I do understand some frustrations, especially recently, because the money we're spending is so much more than it was before. And it's just, but it, it's really a situational sort of issue where it's hard for any of the companies that service our, our collector base to keep up right now, whether it's card companies, grading companies, consignment companies, they're all having trouble keeping up, even ultra pro, you know, having trouble. Yeah 
outfitting the hobby with supplies. So while I hear you and I agree with you, I think it's a great answer. Let's let's be more positive. Let's and there is so much positive. You know, I, all that said, I want to say there is a lot of positivity out there. You go on Instagram, there are guys that are putting out positivity on a regular basis. A couple that come to mind, Jordan Hagedorn, who yeah, I love it. already, you know, he's, he's, he's got a great attitude. He's positive. The gentleman from stack and slabs podcast, he's always spewing out these nice feel good sort of comments on his, on his, on his Instagram. I will say to people watching, if you're in the hobby and you're not on Instagram yet, get on Instagram. It has really become, you know, we used to have, we, we still have message boards. I, I'm heavily involved in one called Hobby Insider. You got Sports Card Forum. You've got Blowout. You've got others. Instagram's really become the place to be, I believe, and uh, and it's just a, a real a real great place to 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 get. You'll get both sides. You know, you'll get some of the negative, but you get a lot of the. You want the negative Facebook. Facebook's full. Facebook is full of negativity. It's full of complaining. It's full of. You know, just a lot, a lot of negativity that just makes you shake your head. Instagram's almost the opposite, and I and I love Instagram for that. Uh, Tracy, we're just past two hours. We're officially in overtime now, so I'm going to throw up overtime. Um, okay, question number five: What's your biggest hobby purchase or sale regret, or just regret in general, if you if you can think of anything? The the one that immediately came to my mind when when you broached the the topic was, I think it was 2001. Uh, Fleer, it was a Fleer wrestling product, and you had to buy a box at the National to meet, I believe this year was Trish Stratus, right? If you bought a box, you got a ticket, and you got to meet Trish Stratus, who I don't know any red-blooded American male who wouldn't want to meet Trish Stratus. Canadian too, by the way, Canadian. Right, she is She is Canadian. I should have said North American male, right? So hmm. no offense. Um, so I bought a box on the show floor. I got my ticket. I took the 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 box to the hotel room that night, and I happened to pull one of the lip service redemption cards of Lita, who was a a, a dynamic wrestling diva back then. They called them divas, and um, and the, the, the uh, lip service was such a novel idea at the time, where the the divas would put on lipstick and they would kiss a card, and then that card would be sent to to whoever had the redemption and. I got Lita, I got the card after a few months of waiting and ultimately I sold it um, on eBay of all things back then. And uh, I've regretted it ever since, so. You want it back. We got to help you find that card. <laughs> card back, right? Okay, so that's the end of the Sports Cards Live 5. Thank you for taking part, Tracy. We're gonna move on now to what I like to call my PC cards of the day. It says card, but it's really going to be cards tonight. And this is where I, the host of Sports Cards Live, Jeremy, I show a few cards from my personal collection that tie into my guest for the evening. So I'm going to start off, Tracy, and I'm going to show you a few cards here that, of course, I only am showing you Panini cards. I think that's only appropriate for right now. So I'm going to show you, and they're all hockey cards. So I'm going to take everybody back to... 2000 and I believe it's 11, 12 Panini Dominion Hockey made some beautiful cards and these were among my favorites. So you're also a Dallas Stars fan. So I'm going to show you my my Mike Medano stick side signatures numbered out of 25. And this came from like a, a set of about 25, 30 cards or so. And I complete, I, I have the complete, I did the complete set and I, it wow. took me years to do it. So I want to show you the Mike Medano because, you know, it's it, the autograph actually shows up nicer than you can see. And I'm going yeah, to show, yeah, yeah. show it to you on, on a scan shortly. But from that, that, on the, that, is that on the stick or is that on the, the stick, tape? Stick side. Okay. Uh, it's right. stick. It's stick. Okay. I also have from that set the Gordie Howe, numbered to five, an extremely rare hard card to locate. And he signed in a gold wow. Sharpie on a piece of the stick. I don't know what it says, but an amazing Gordy Howe card, you know, who's Beautiful. been deceased for a while. So I have those two for my stick size signature set. Now I'm going to show you four cards from 12, from 13, 14 Panini National Treasures Hockey. I loved National Treasures Hockey because the acetate top layer just made these things glisten. And <clears throat> now I didn't collect the RPAs. I collected the base card numbers patch parallel. I don't know if you remember these, but what you guys did is you took the base set, which was a vertical oriented card, and you created a horizontal parallel 
doesn't look at all like it, but a horizontal parallel. And each card was numbered to the player's jersey number. So you've got a few one ones all the way to out of nine out of 97 or 98, whatever it was. And I completed the whole set. But I, Tracy, I went further than that. I completed the whole set basically twice because I wanted to get the jersey numbered card. So if it was a one of one, I had to have it. If if it was, for example, Brian Leach, defenseman for the New York Rangers, his number was two. You guys only made two of that. I wanted the two of two. And if okay. I could get the one of two, I would have it as well so I could complete two sets. Wow. So the first one I'm going to show you, I'll start with the two Dallas cards I have. This is the Mike Medano. This is numbered nine of nine because he oh, wore wow. number nine, of course. Okay. You know, Decent, yeah. nice three-color patch. Nothing crazy, but these cards are just beautiful. I, I, I love them the first time I saw them. I also have the Jamie Benn. 14 of 14. That's a one color, but hey, I have a I do have in my other set a gorgeous three color. So <laughs> okay. okay. And then a couple of really spectacular ones. First, I'll show this is one one of the three one. I'm still missing one of the one of ones, but I have two of the other ones, one of which is the Roberto Luongo. Oh, so wow. this is numbered one of one right under the right yeah, under the patch dude. there. Yeah. That's a nice pack. I'm gonna show a better picture of that. That was awesome. And then one of the great, one of the legendary players who's still in the league, Alexander Ovechkin. This is the eight of eight. Wow. Yeah, with a real nice patch. For, uh, it looks like a number patch. Yeah, that's beautiful. Four color as well. <laughs> and then the last card I'm going to show, because Prism is, you know, the cat's meow now, and it's really has gone back. And, you know, the early Prism hockey cards have become – they, they're selling for way more than they did like six months ago, like even more so than we're, we're seeing increases across the board. These have increased like from $10 to $500 kind of thing. So I picked up, this is a recent pickup. I paid for it. It's a 1213 Panini Prism Blue from 2012, the first year, Sidney Crosby out of 25 in a BGS 95 holder. Wow. I had to get one of these before they just, you couldn't find them anymore. That's beautiful, man. Look at that. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. Really, really nice. I'm going to quickly just uh, do this, Tracy. Uh, this one here, and here we go. So let me just remove the banner. And uh, so this is the Mike Medano I showed you. So you can see it. It's on a stick piece there. You got yeah, a bit of that awesome. green from the, the stick design. There's uh -huh. the Gordy Howe, a beautiful wow. card. There's the Jamie Ben. Uh, these cards are so nice. They, they glisten like I was saying. Yeah, There's awesome. a Luongo, a nice picture of the Luongo. There's the Alexander Ovechkin. I, I still love these cards, Tracy. I, I love That's them. So That's yeah. so great. And then there's the uh, Sidney Crosby. What is that one limited to? Is that 25. 25 wow. copies, yeah. You know, the, the Prism Gold would be would be great to have too, but those are those have gone absolutely bonkers, even for hockey. I was, you know, my favorite hockey player of all time, Tracy, is uh, is Tamu Solani, played for okay. the Ducks and, you know, the, the Winnipeg Jets early on. Mm -hmm. I did pick up his gold card, uh, which was I was very happy to be able to do. That's so awesome. that brings us to the end of the the segments. I'm going to now we're going to now we're Tracy, we're going to start winding down the show by going through a few of the uh, the final comments. Okay. So I'm going to ask everybody watching. I know you guys I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, first of all. Tracy, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. I want to thank you for uh, publicizing that you were coming on and hopefully brought some new viewers to the channel, which I greatly appreciate. If you are one of those people and you are not yet subscribed, please hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. Please hit that thumbs up button. Leave your comment. It's all greatly appreciated. Love the interaction. It's been enjoyable tonight. And I know we had, you know, there was potential for, there's some some of these, some of my episodes because of the, the caliber of guests that I'm able to attract to the show Sometimes, you know, we can have controversial issues and, you know, I just want to thank the viewers for remaining respectful because that's important. And, and if you're not respectful, I'm just not going to address you. So I think just about everybody got addressed tonight. And, uh, and I, so I really, a genuine thank you for being respectful and for, you know, and Tracy for handling some of the challenging questions uh, really well. Well done, man. Well done. So oh, thank you, man. That's, you guys are great. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate that. So I like Brom says, I thought I heard butt plugs and ducks. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to put that up, but we'll put it up. It's funny. It's funny. That's funny. That's funny. Um, a couple more comments. I'm just going to sort of scan them quickly. Uh, Ziggy says, Instagram transactions concern me. Facebook has self-policing. IG has more fraud without self-policing. Okay. Now, Ziggy, I just want to respond to that by saying, do you know for a fact that Instagram has more fraud without self-policing or is that conjecture? Not coming at you one way or the other, just 
you know, is that a fact? I've seen lots of uh, transactions go down on Instagram and I've actually today was the first time that I saw an issue get aired out on Instagram. And the problem was that the guy who did, someone backed out of a deal and sold the card to somebody else after taking a deposit, the deposit was returned. I mean, that's an issue, but nobody lost anything except like no one stole anything is all I'm saying. So, uh, you know, and I think I do want to call out my, you know, brand new sponsor of the show, the big three sports cards, the big three hockey. I'm going to put them on the, on the, on the ticker one more time right here. Follow. This is Karn Rye. One of, uh, you know, these guys take single high-end sports card sales to the next level. Very professional. Um, just, you know, integrity and all that. I wouldn't align myself with them unless I was confident in the integrity and the reputation of this particular entity. And uh, so, you know, and they do a lot of deals on Instagram. So please follow them on Instagram. And if you ever deal with them on Instagram, I'm endorsing them. And, you know, I think that hopefully that says something. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, but back to the comments. Iggy, thanks for the comment, you know, uh, and your perspective is valid. Uh, but I, when I ask you, like, are you sure about that? I, that's just, that's a legit question. Jake says Facebook and Instagram are both owned by, by Facebook. Doesn't change what goes on on each uh, platform, Jake. But thank you for the comment. Does make sense. Baubles and bar, ball cards. Good evening and hello to you, sir. Uh, Charles says, I wish Instagram had more vintage hockey. Ch by the way, Charles is like a 13 or 14 year old guy who collects vintage hockey from well before he was born. Really interesting guy. That's He's awesome. Been one of my after hours episodes. That's cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. And one of these guys that represents what the future of the hobby can look like. So welcome Charles. Thanks for tuning in. I, even though I know you've been here all along. Bobbles and Ballheads says, what's up Ziggy and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Uh, love it guys. Love it. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Now we're getting to the thank you. So we're going to run through those. Paul C. Great show as always. Thank you so much, Paul C. Uh, ta taunting Carlos from afar. I haven't seen Carlos here, but I have a feeling he's in the background. Uh, Yamwax, good to see you tonight, Corey. Great discussions, Tracy and Jeremy. Excellent listening during turkey prep. Thank you both. Thanks, Yam, for tuning in. And there's another great Instagram account, guys. You want you want to follow good people in the hobby? Follow Yamwax under that same name on Instagram. Just a great guy. Just a great guy. Jake S., thank you for joining. Hockey, hockey, great to have you. Thanks, both of us, Tracy. You're welcome. Ziggy, happy thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and pass the comments where they're talking to each other. Sorry about that, guys. Ziggy, another amazing night. Thank you all. Thank you, Ziggy. Charles, thank you very much. Jeremy Pringle, thanks to you. We love you too, Jeremy. <laughs> Joe uh, Joe Perot, it's understandable why Panini and Trust Tracy is a spokesperson for the brand. He embodies Panini with positivity, humility, and care for the collector. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, thank Joe. You, okay. See, we do have positivity in the hobby. We do. We do. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joe. That's awesome. Slow Pitch Fanatic. Thanks, Jeremy and Tracy. Great show tonight. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks. Same to you, Slow Pitch Fanatic. Thank you for joining. I'm going to read Ziggy's uh, sort of uh, response to the, the whole Instagram thing. He says, I hear of more stories of repeat account on IG. In an IG, you manage your IG. Facebook is a group. So more eyes and admins. It is hard to police Instagram. There are efforts, but in my opinion, more risk. I think you're right, Ziggy. I think you're right. There is more risk. But I will say, if you're going to do transactions on Instagram, get vouchers. Don't do transactions with something that you don't trust. Really protect yourself. You know, almost like a buyer beware sort of thing where Facebook, the whole vouching system is much more uh, mature at this point. So yeah, good point, Ziggy. Absolute. Jeremy, sorry I missed you live last few shows. Nice virtual. See you Saturday. Thank you, Absolute. Great to have you back. Salute to you as well. All right, end of the comments. Thanks everybody for joining us. Tracy, final words from you. Oh, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you for the opportunity, Jeremy. You have a, you know, like I told you, my uh, my interactions with Canadians have always been positive and passionate, and th that's certainly what it was tonight. Uh, I I enjoy you, and I enjoy your audience, and the the way you conduct the show has been a lot of fun, and uh, just appreciate the opportunity. And look forward to doing it again. Well, I, I greatly, greatly appreciate it, Tracy. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. Like I said in my intro, you you, you have a great energy. Um, you know, you're a positive guy. You're the right guy for the job. You're, you're, you're just a great guy in the hobby, man. I've known about you for like 15 years. And uh, so to be able to hang out with you tonight, hang out with you a couple nights ago, it's been a lot of fun, man. One of the best parts about doing the show is getting to hang out with my guests, 
not just one night, but two, because I do insist on these planning sessions. And mm -hmm. um, so it really does, uh, it really does enhance my hobby experience overall. And I hope by virtue of the preparation that we do, it comes across in the episode for the viewers to really, you know, to just maybe enjoy it more than if we didn't do that. So I don't want to give all my secrets away. We'll leave it at that. But, uh, but I want to thank you for joining everybody else who's still watching, you know, thanks so much. Absolute reminds every, everyone to hit the thumbs up, like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you haven't yet, I will be back on Saturday with Ken Reed from Sportsnet next Wednesday with Brian Grace, Leaf CEO, always an entertaining episode. Be sure to follow the big three sports cards on Instagram. It's on the right now at the big three hockey. These guys are awesome. They're supporting me. And, uh, and you know, I just think that's great. And Chris West wants to know how excited for metal am I, Jeremy? Very excited, Chris. Tracy, thanks again. Hang on right there. Everybody else, good night. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all back here again live on Saturday. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Matthew Jones, comment noted. Thanks for sharing and letting us know more about here. I'm going to throw it up there. He says, thanks for sharing, Tracy, and letting us know more about Panini. Very, very insightful. Thank you, Matthew Jones. No more comments, guys. I want to stop it. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Tracy.